what Chairman Powell told us was that a strong labor market, strong economy wouldn't preclude them from cutting rates. And I think that's still the case. As you see from the policy speak, there is no hurry for cuts anytime soon. That's why the Fed's pushed back. I think they have scar tissue from this inflation of the last couple of years. Chair Powell might be having a challenge corralling everybody on the committee. I think he wants to make that first move based on a strong consensus. The problem that we have in the market in this zombie-like economic environment where it's not discernible, you're chasing your tail. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Bramwitz together with Amory Horta and I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 slightly softer here by 0.1%. You saw the headlines yesterday within striking distance of 5K on the S&P 500. Bramo just waiting and waiting and waiting within five points at a close of 5K. And it's not coming with exactly this rip-roaring feeling of bullishness and conviction. It's coming with the sort of like, all right, I guess the MAG7 are going to keep on doing their thing. We'll go into them. We're going to hope for it to broaden out a little bit. We're not going to bank on that, and maybe we can get there. I mean, it's not exactly like people are just screaming, yes, let's go. This was a big feature of the conversation yesterday on the program, standing on the shoulders of fewer and fewer stocks. The MAG7 becoming the MAG6, 5, 4, maybe even 3, 2, 1. NVIDIA earnings coming up in a few weeks' time. We got some good news yesterday, though. In the bond market, let's talk about fixed income. Had a 10-year Treasury auction, biggest slate on record. It went pretty well. It went well. It came in at a lower yield than where uh, some of the bonds were trading just moments before the auction. Why? Is it because people really are feeling better about the economic outlook? Or is it because there's some residual fear out there as a result of banking issues or a concern that there's going to be some sort of downturn? I wonder how much of a reprieve this bond market has gotten through the lingering worries that are kind of hanging out there that are kind of dampening down too much enthusiasm. Gene Tanuta of Columbia Threadneed was saying this is about locking in rates. Well, they get another opportunity to do just that a little bit later. 30-year supply, that number, $25 billion. US dollars. Are we comfortable with the size of the deficit in the United States? By we, who are you talking about? Not you. If you look at the Congressional <laughs> Budget Office, they came out with their projections yesterday. Interest expense. I mean, again, I go back to a PICTOL, the toggle bond, payment in kind junk bond, where basically you borrow more money to cover your interest payments because you don't have enough in terms of the revenue. That's essentially the US government. You're talking about interest payments that are now exceeding the cost of defense spending in the United States this year for the first time. Net interest payments climb 3.1% of GDP, highest going back to record since 1940. This it's, is concerning. It's insane. So we can rely on people down in Washington, D.C. to fix this. Let's talk about the leadership, the race to be the president of the United States. So the former president is confusing Nikki Haley with Nancy Pelosi. The current president is confusing French leaders and overnight he's now confusing German leaders. Yeah, that's right. This is another episode of the president confusing European leaders. It comes over the weekend. Let's like map this out over the weekend. He confused Emmanuel Macron with Mitterrand, which got a ton of blowback in French press, by the way. And then last night in New York at two fundraiser, fundraisers, he was telling this story yet again of his time at the G7. And instead of saying it was Angela Merkel that looked to him and said, can you imagine this happened at the British Parliament? He confused it with Helmut Kohl who died, Jonathan, many years ago. He's not just confused in decades, Bramo. These people are dead. They're not here anymore. It's insane. You want me to comment on this? Please do. Oh. I think it's important. OK. This raises this question of what's the bar right now? I go back to what Jim McKelvey said yesterday. Yeah. You have the Democrats with a front runner who is the least likely to win against Trump, and you have Trump who is the least likely to win against Biden. You have two unwanted candidates going face to face, and now it's just a race to the bottom, and we get to experience it for a whole more of nine months or whatever it is. It is a political marriage. They're married politically in order for both of them to be able to stay in this race. One thing I would say, when we did our, conducted our last iteration of the Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll, people can write in things they like about individuals or candidates. For Biden, I'm looking back at some of these responses, Democrats are saying things that are very concerning about his age and mental acuity. When you have episodes like you had yesterday in front of peers, people who want to give him money, 
that is when it's going to really start to become very concerning. We'll talk about the political mess down in Washington a little bit later on the program. The broader price action looks like this this morning. We're down by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Equities a little softer. In the bond market, yields just a touch lower on a 10-year, 4.1172 on a US 10-year. Coming up this hour, Ben Laidler of Toro with the S&P 500 on the verge of 5,000. Anna Ashton of Eurasia Group as deflation deepens in China. And Geetha Raghunathan of Bloomberg Intelligence as Disney looks to turn a corner. Let's talk about Disney in the pre-market. Lisa up by something like 6%. Turning a corner, all right, cutting costs. That stock is up by 6.6%. Cutting costs, uh, really trying to boost the cash dividend. And this is a story we've seen with big tech and others of how to attract people. I also think it's back to the future again. Moana, too. We're talking about, you know, the issues. Of, There's a lot of examples of that at Disney. I, but that's my point. It's sort of, you know, going back to the tried and true and saying, all right, come on back. And everyone's singing Moana and you go to the theaters. But it's, you know, basically breeding nostalgia. Hugh Johnston, formerly of PepsiCo now of the Walt Disney Company, the CFO coming up a little bit later this morning. We begin with our top story this hour, the S&P 500 on the verge of 5K. Ben Lader of eToro expecting the rally to continue, saying this, lower inflation and coming interest rate cuts will drive an investor rotation from 23 US and big tech winners to rate sensitive losers. Ben Laidler joins us now for more. Ben, let's get into it. Striking distance of 5K on the S&P 500. What's going to lead to that broadening of this rally away from big tech? Uh, maybe a little bit of time until we get interest rate cuts and until we continue to see this idiosyncratic earnings recovery. I think those are the two drivers for new highs for the S&P 500 and, frankly, for, for global equities. But also, the further we get into it, right now we're talking about rate cuts, we're talking about earnings acceleration. Later in the year, I think we're actually going to be seeing them. That is, I think, the trigger for the rotation from you know, these crowded and justifiably very expensive and well-performing big tech names, frankly, into everything else, um, which you know, has lagged and is, is a lot cheaper. At the same time, Ben, there has been some weaker than expected performance in certain pockets of equity earnings. And we've seen that at a time where it's unclear how much the Fed is going to cut rates. Does this make you rethink some of your bullishness? Not really. I think we maybe recalibrate a little bit where we expect to make the returns. So I think we've had a little bit of a pushback from the Fed on the pace and extent of the rate cuts. So maybe we make a little bit less on the valuation side. But I actually think, you know, the, with the economy growing as strongly as it is right now, with the productivity boom we have underway, uh, and with, you know, earnings right now, 80% beats, running at 8% up, so better than last, uh, better than last quarter. I think the earnings story actually is looking is looking a little bit better, running a little bit ahead of schedule. I love speaking to you, Ben, because you talk about how the Fed put his back and we all said, no way. And then everybody followed on and said the same thing. You were talking about being bullish and everyone said, you got to be cautious. You were right. Now you're going full bull in some of your notes where you're talking about the potential for buying European real estate, broadening out. Is this a now trade or is this a later trade when you start to get some conviction around some of these other themes? I think it's a later trade that you get ready for now, uh, A, and B, I don't think there's too much risk to being early. I don't think, you know, there's, I don't think there's anybody on the planet that knows that European real estate is not a troubled, cheap, depressed asset class right now, or more broadly, Europe. You know, double digit earnings declines, you know, in recession. I mean, the bad news is out there. We just may need to wait a little bit for the catalyst to really, you know, come through. So, you know, do the research now, dribble some money in now. But I, I think for Europe and more broadly for, you know, markets, I think the differences from last year will be, you know, it'll be a little, you know, we're annualizing a 35% return for the S&P 500 right now. I don't think we're going to see that for the full year. So I think, you know, a bit of a slowdown, back-ended returns, but broader returns. Because again, right now, this is a one-legged, you know, MAG7 stool. Um, I think it you know, broadens out later in the year. Ben, these rent-sensitive losers, can we talk about them a little bit more? Not just real estate. Is it the banks as well? Because I look at the regional banks and they feel like rate-sensitive losers over the last year, not the winners we'd expect them to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, you know, there's plenty of risks out there, commercial real estate, small banks, you know, China. I guess the point I would just make, you know, these are the sort of, you know, the most talked about, slowest moving, you know, train wrecks in history. Um, you know, policymakers, you know, everybody's all, all over that, I think. And, and I think it's well sort of discounted, discounted in markets. Um, so, you know, I'm looking at 
these sort of cheaper, more discounted sectors. So that can be real estate, but it's also basic materials, industrials, um, and you know, and partly financials. That's the biggest sector in Europe. Um, but, but you know, but there's also a big regional component to this. It's everything outside the U.S. where these more cyclical sectors are just much more heavily weighted. They don't have these these big tech sectors. So it's Europe, and you know, dare I say it, um, under my breath, China. Well, let's talk about China. The data overnight. It looks like deflation is deepening. It looks like China wants to deal with the symptoms to try and start support the stock market without dealing with the underlying problems. Ben, how can you be optimistic on what's happening there right now? Yeah, so, so I'm not overly optimistic, right? I think, you know, if you want to play that cyclical global rotation trade, I think Europe is the place to go rather than China. I think, you know, the risk is China's a value trap. The economy's up 15 times in 25 years. The stock market's flat. So history's not on my side. But... You know, eight times earnings, extraordinarily depressed you know, investor sentiment. The authorities, yes, they may be beginning to deal with the symptoms rather than the underlying cure, but at least they're dealing with something. Um, and, and fourthly, let's not forget, this is very much a self-inflicted problem. You know, they decided to crack down on the over-indebted, you know, property sector. Uh, they could easily wake up tomorrow and, and decide you know, to, be a, to be a little bit more forceful. That makes me, you know, moderately positive, but... You know, risks are clearly higher in China than they are in many other markets. Well, Ben, what would you want to see out of China? Because we've seen them try a number of things to prop up the market. It hasn't exactly worked. What would you actually want to see to become more optimistic? They have some of the highest real interest rates in the world. I think they should be cutting interest rates, quite frankly. Um, I think they should be more forceful of the property market. I think that's one of the underlying causes of uh, the consumer weakness. I mean, there's three drivers of this Chinese weakness, the property sector, the weak consumer and the global manufacturing uh, recession. They can't do anything about global manufacturing, but I think they can definitely do more about the uh, about the first two. They have the policy tools. They have the policy you know, flexibility. They should be you know, pulling those levers you know, a little bit more. And again, I think a little bit of good news could go a very long way, given how cheap, depressed and out of favor you know, Chinese stocks are. Ben, can you be even moderately bullish on China and also believe in the disinflation story? I don't really believe the disinflation story. I think you, you know, dig into the numbers. I think this was probably the worst month for disinflation. You know, we've had 30% declines in pork prices. I don't think any of that's going to be repeated. So I mean, globally, know. Ben, I mean, globally, in the disinflation story for Europe, the disinflation story for the US, the commodity driven kind of disinflation that a lot of people are celebrating. So I think that's a given. I don't think that's gone away. I mean, what I'm focusing on is the productivity boom. Um, and that is what's driving this immaculate disinflation you know, we're seeing globally. Um, there's a real question mark as to whether that's going to continue. But you know, right now we're seeing it. And I think you can make the argument uh, that maybe it does, that this sort of productivity paradox we've lived with for a long time is beginning to end. And if productivity can continue to grow at, double, you know, at twice long-term average levels, which is what it's growing on in the US, then, then I think we can thread this needle and company profits will, will benefit handsomely. Ben, always constructive, optimistic. It's good to hear from you. Ben Laidler of eToro, great to catch up. Ben was one of the first to come on the show last year and talk about the return of the Fed put, which sounded really, really foreign at the time because we hadn't heard it for about two years. But he was right. The Federal Reserve, based on what we heard from Chairman Powell just last week, is willing to step in if things deteriorate and isn't afraid of strong growth. They're willing to embrace it. That's a change. This, to me, is the reason why you're still pricing in more than 20% chance of a March rate cut. They basically all but told us, you're not going to get a March rate cut. But the fact that people are still expecting it means that there's some sort of boogeyman lurking out there that they think could rear its head and the Fed will come in. And also the fact they're pushing back and we're still talking about 5K on the S&P 500. Correct. We have pushed back expectations and stocks are still doing all right. We're doing okay this morning. We're down about 0.1% on the S&P 500. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Israel and the U.S. are split on a proposed response by Hamas to pause fighting and release dozens of hostages. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected the proposal. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken told reporters Hamas's response, quote, creates space for agreement. The U.S. has sought to ease the fighting in the Middle East since Hamas's attack on October 7th. Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont has unveiled a plan to challenge New York State's rule for taxing remote workers. New York requires workers to pay income tax to the state if their job is based there, even if they work remotely outside state lines. The governor's plan for his, his part encourages residents to file suits against New York in order to get tax refunds. Lamont says the proposal could generate over $200 million annually if successful. 
Apple's limited release of its Vision Pro headset is prompting a hefty resale market. The $3,500 device is only available in certain U.S. stores, and overseas resellers are charging a chunky premium. Some are going for more than $5,000, $5,000 rather, that's the right amount. Apple has limited the rollout of the new headset in order to accommodate the elaborate setup and customization process for each buyer. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Danny, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's pause. <sighs> they are the masters at this, to create scarcity. And all of a sudden you're thinking 3,500 is expensive. Now I'm anchored at five. So 3,500 sounds like a bargain when it's available. Apple, I'm not sure if they do this deliberately or not. It's not for me to say I've got no inside information on that. But. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying they are the absolute masters of creating scarcity that may or may not exist. You know what this reminds me of? What's that? Sneaker drops. This, to me, reminds me of the flipping that happens with sneakers and it's sort of, you know, limited edition. You can get these and then sell them. That's, you know, a similar kind of playbook. One individual in Singapore is selling it for $6,300. That's nuts. We should have been buying them up, waiting online, and then reselling them in And when you markets. start to get supply, what happens? All of a sudden, that's what I'm talking about. 3,500 feels good. Shouldn't feel good. <laughs> but it starts well, to feel better relative to what's happening in the so-called secondary market. It's also, who are the buyers? It's people who want to be ahead of things. It's people who want to be gadget folks. Hardcore gamers. Yeah. So... OK, that's enough of Apple. More on that a little bit later, maybe. Up next on a program, <laughs> a fight over the border preserved for the presidential election. Americans are ticked off that this is not resolved. And they expect us to get things done. So why don't we do that? That conversation is coming up next. You're watching Bloomberg TV. The stock market very, very close to 5K on the S&P 500 at the close yesterday. Equity futures pulling back just a little bit. We're down 0.14% on the S&P. Yields doing nothing. 4.1192. Really decent 10-year auction yesterday. Yields this morning unchanged. Under surveillance this morning, a fight over the border preserved for the presidential election. Less than 24 hours after we released the bill, my Republican colleagues changed their minds. Turns out... They want all talk and no action. Americans are ticked off that this is not resolved. And they expect us to get things done. So why don't we do that? So why don't we? Here's the latest. Senate Democrats promising a vote today on a standalone bill to deliver aid to Israel and Ukraine. It comes after the GOP killed an attempt to combine border security and international aid. Ed Mills and Raymond James suggesting the strategy may not pay off for Republicans writing this. The border deal is a classic example of wanting to keep the issue versus solving the problem. But the defeat of the border bill is adding to the complication for everything. Ed Mills joins us now for more. So Ed, as we know, and welcome to the program, sir, as always, as we know, Thanks. it's the president that's taken the blame on this issue. He polls really badly on it. Is there any reason to believe that changes in the weeks and months to come after the debacle of the last couple of days? Well, clearly, John, both sides are going to be positioning for the upper hand on the fight related to the border. Um, there's a lot of polling that suggests that this election is going to be kind of on domestic issues such as inflation, uh, the border, geopolitical risk. And for Republicans, and the reason why I wrote that is that for Trump, the border is kind of core to his strategy to win this election. As a Republican, why would you kind of take away or reduce the strength of that fight? And for folks like Senator Langford, who had a really good attempt here at getting a deal, he learned a lesson that in politics, when you're explaining, you're losing. And so his base did not want this bill because they didn't want to take away the issue. They want to put a lot of pressure on President Biden. Uh, Biden certainly kind of does not want to kind of have this as an issue going into November. There's going to be a lot of pressure on him for executive action. Um, but the politics here, they're swinging widely. And I think it's a little too early to say exactly who wins, but the the pressure right now is going to be on Republicans to explain what happened with this bill and for Biden to explain what's happening with the border. Ed, with that as the background, 
How did Republicans then sign up for foreign aid to Taiwan, Israel, and Ukraine when they said, we are not going to sign up for another dime of foreign aid until we have a border deal? Well, right now, Plan B is going back to Plan A. Um, and there's still a strong support of military kind of aid to Israel, to Taiwan, to Ukraine. Uh, but again, it's into this kind of when you're explaining you're losing. So the backup strategy is to do this defense only bill. Um, that was getting a vote last night. It went into overtime. They don't have the 60 votes in the Senate just yet. So they're going to reconvene today at noon to see if they can get one or two more Republicans on board. You're actually going to give them uh, more amendments to go on that bill to get them to that 60 votes. And those amendments, guess what? They're probably border related provisions. Um, and, you know, in the House this week, we had a vote to uh, have the impeachment of the HHS secretary, had a vote on an Israel only bill. Those bills both, you know, failed. This just shows just the toxicity that's going on on these issues right now in D.C. And there's real market impacts from the kind of defense sector, uh, what happens with folks kind of tied to border security. But I'd also just take a step back and say, as D.C. remains in chaos, markets are hitting new highs. So make sure we don't get too much of this kind of chaos in D.C. into our kind of thinking as it relates to the broader market. It's astonishing to wake up and see the Republicans are struggling to get this over the finish line when the minority leader is a defense hawk. How diminished is Mitch McConnell's role right now and power in the Senate? Yeah, that's a really good question, because I think what we're seeing here is um, Mitch McConnell, who we always could vote, you know, kind of be certain that he knew exactly where his caucus was, where the votes are. Uh, he's really dismissed uh, or kind of moved away from former President Trump and his caucus as they are kind of getting ready for Trump as the nominee and the head of the party, uh, once again, are moving away from Mitch McConnell. And so kind of what Mitch McConnell wants versus what his caucus wants are increasingly two separate things. Is he going to be the leader by the end of this Congress? I don't know. Is Johnson going to be the speaker by the end of the month? I don't know. Um, so when we have any bipartisan deals, the word you should be watching is uniparty. Anything that's bipartisan is being viewed by the Republican uh, base as uniparty. That means kind of the uh, folks in D.C. are not with the rest of the base. And that gets really hard to support. Bipartisanship is a four letter word right now in D.C. And it's amazing. Let's talk about the future. It's clearly a mess down in Washington, D.C. And if you're looking at this country at the moment and you're hoping there's a different way, a different set of options, let's compare the two on the table going into the election in November. We've got one leader, the former president, who is confusing Nikki Haley with Nancy Pelosi. We've got another leader, the sitting president, who is confusing European leaders with deceased European leaders from different decades. Ed, what is this going to look like, not in two months, but in six, when this really picks up? John, I think that those are kind of important, especially in the political context. But I kind of try not to get into too much of kind of misquotes kind of on a campaign trail versus what are the real policies. I'm focused much more on kind of what would the policies of a President Trump be versus what the policies of a Joe Biden. That's when I get questions here at Raymond James. Uh, where folks are mostly focused on. So when we think about the future of this election, uh, what people are focused on is what happens with tax cuts as they expire next sure. December? What happens with bank regulation? What happens with all of these policies versus those individual statements? Ed Mills of Raymond James. Ed, thank you. Thank I you. guess what I'm focused on, Bramo, is their ability to orchestrate things down in Washington and actually deliver the policies that they're talking about, their ability to convey those policies to the electorate when they're campaigning. Exactly to that point. We're not talking about those things. We don't know what their views are. We're not sure exactly what those policies are going to be. It's not getting any clearer because we're talking instead about all the other stuff, the politics of it, the mishaps, etc. And at a certain point, it's I get the sense that a lot of people on Wall Street are tuning it out until they have to sure. pay attention. I get it. If you're frustrated by this now, wait a few months. I'm wait sure a few we're months. All excited it's for that. just warming up. It was the a fun things we're last talking night. about are going to get so much worse. And they're serious. I mean, again, the CBO report yesterday really yeah. put that into the fore. Anna Ashton of Eurasia Group is joining us next with pressure mounting on China to step up support. That conversation up next from New York. This is Bloomberg.
Stocks on the S&P 500 pulling back. We're down by 0.2% on the Nasdaq. We're down by two tenths also. The Russell negative by a half of 1%, getting closer and closer to 5K at a close just yesterday. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Let's talk about this bond market, the 10-year. Supply went pretty decent yesterday, $42 billion of 10-year treasuries. Pretty strong. That's a record for a 10-year auction. Yields lower than what we anticipated. The 30-year a little bit later, $25 billion worth. At least to the yield this morning, 434 16 And it comes in tandem with the market bringing down some of inflation expectations over a longer term. The stability in the bond market is notable to me, given that a lot of people are talking about the risk of reinflation later on this year. It's not showing up in the auctions, so we can just not care about them until they do. Move on from Treasuries until it starts to matter. Maybe it matters this afternoon. Let's finish on foreign exchange. There's a new number that I keep hearing. It's 105. Heard 105 from Jane Foley of Rabobank yesterday, looking for the euro to drop from 107 to 105. Sock Gen's Kit Jukes this morning. Lisa talking about the same number, the prospect of dropping to 105. So basically this conviction for a bit more dollar strength, but not that much, not the bold, crazy parody calls. This is sort of the sort of slow moving train. Everyone knows the U.S. is doing a lot better than Europe. Now it's a question of when you start with the rate cuts and also what has been priced in. And I think that the strength of the U.S. hadn't been fully priced in relative to the ongoing weakness in Europe. And we had a ton of easing priced into markets for the Federal Reserve. Then the Fed started pushing back against that. And that pushback is reinforced by the data. The economic data has been pretty strong. So Kit says this, if the market embraces the idea that the Fed's projection of three cuts this year is in fact what's going to happen, the dollar's got something like 2 to 3% upside, which isn't a major move, Lisa, when you think about it. 2 to 3% down from one to 105 on the euro. It's kind of going back to what Ben Laidler was, later, later was saying. We basically have all of these knowns out there. It's just a question of calibrating what's priced in and how to sort of re-risk some of the issues. And that's kind of what you see going on with this currency pair. The euro just a touch weaker on the session. Under surveillance this morning, your top stories, US forces killing the commander of an Iran-backed militia group with a drone strike in Iraq overnight. The Pentagon claiming the leader was responsible for directly planning and participating in attacks on U.S. forces in the region. The U.S. military vowing to continue its response to paramilitary groups and Houthi rebels after a deadly attack on a U.S. base in Jordan last month. AMH, that effort continues. Yeah, it does continue, but we heard from Qatab Hezbollah, and they said on Telegram that set your clocks for revenge time. So it does look like our forces in the Middle East are going to be on guard for what is going on, the, the constant also what's going on in the Red Sea. This is a little bit different. I took away from this strike the fact that this is not the United States just degrading Iranian military proxy capability. This is actually a response to those three service members that died in Jordan. And also, this will serve as a deterrent. We know where your personnel is, and we have the ability to harm you. Honestly, to me, I just start thinking about some of the corporate blowback. The fact that Maersk came out and talked about how this is not, uh, we haven't even seen this peak, that they've seen ongoing attacks on their ships, that they actually expect a much lower outlook for the year as a result of it. The fact that because of the ongoing conflict, we saw sales at McDonald's and Starbucks fall off a cliff. This is having a real impact on specific companies. And I'm, that's really what I'm watching as this sort of uh, continues. Let's talk about Maersk right now. This used to be one of my favorite companies, CEOs to interview when we were based over in Europe, just to get inside on the global economy. To Lisa's point, attacks on vessels in the area in the Red Sea have pushed rates higher, but shipments have been dramatically slowed with carriers taking the long route around Africa. The CEO telling Bloomberg this morning there is no clear timetable as to when and how the international community, Lisa, will be able to guarantee safe passage. That's what they're confronting right now. This stock was doing well at one point off the back of maybe higher rates but ultimately this morning it's down hard by 16 percent and they were talking about how this could go on for another year and i don't think that they would want their shares to plunge by 15 percent and just be sort of uh you know cavalier about making some of these projections so if that's the case you have to wonder about other broader implications on a macro level because right now people are kind of watching this as a possible tail risk you're seeing it actually come into the numbers, and I really do think that that's important. That stock is lower this morning. Let's talk about a name that is higher, Disney. The Walt Disney Company CEO, Bob Iger, saying the company is turning the corner. The company beating earnings expectations thanks to cost cuts and performance in international theme parks. Subscribers to Disney fell in the last quarter, but Iger forecasting that streaming will be profitable by fall. Disney also spending big on gaming. How about this, announcing a $1.5 billion investment 
in Epic Games. The stock is up by 6%. We'll catch up with the CFO, Lisa, later on today. So some of the key questions here is, A, the sports bundling uh, sort of effort, how that's going to play into all of this. Uh, B, where some of the growth is going to come from, because you do not see the streamer uh, subscriber growth coming there. So where are they exactly going to push this, given that they've tried to raise prices and they've increased profit margins there? And then C, are we ever going to see new characters, or is this all nostalgia? I'm serious. Growth is coming from one, they're trying to tap the star power of Taylor Swift, which also politicians in Washington, D.C. are also after. But two, I'm confused about Disney going to be announcing an ESPN service in 2025. What's the difference between the ESPN streaming service and the bundle that they're getting behind? I've got a lot of questions about that. I've got questions about this as well. This is one of the poster charts for American Inc. Now, Starbucks got hit. McDonald's got hit. Walt Disney theme park still doing okay? That's a curious one, isn't it? Yeah. Internationally, why are they doing okay and the others are struggling in the face of U.S. foreign policy? Yeah. Why is Zootopia in Shanghai a bright spot for them? I mean, really, this is a key question. I'm glad that you brought this up. How long can they continue to bank on that, given the fact that, the, that China hasn't been very friendly to U.S. businesses? And how come it has been so immune? Let's turn to China. Consumer prices falling at the fastest pace since 2009, adding pressure on the government to step up support. Anna Ashton of Eurasia Group writing this. The bias towards control and security oriented policy coupled with a lack of clarity on policy direction will weigh on confidence and disappoint expectations, further entrenching a sense of economic malaise. Anna Ashton joins us now for more. Anna, you're right on the money. This is where we've been focused on the last week, the last month, why they're so preoccupied with the price of stocks and not the underlying issues. Is that going to change, Anna, anytime soon? Well, first of all, I have to say that that was my colleague's writing. Um, but I agree that she's right on the money. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that it is going to change anytime soon. The reality is that uh, the government is not prepared to respond with stronger stimulus measures. Uh, it's not clear what kinds of stimulus measures would really do the trick of boosting consumer demand anyway. And there is this continued tension between emphasizing national security and emphasizing economic growth. It, it creates confusion for businesses and it also isn't helping the continuing weak consumer demand. There have been also some surprising personnel shifts uh, recently, Anna, including the recent firing of the head of the nation's security regulator in the wake of the briefing that Xi Jinping got. They appointed a new uh, person, a 58-year-old market veteran. What do you make of this, some of the personnel shifts, the abrupt changes that have come on the, on the heels of some of these market moves? Well, I think, you know, a personnel shift uh, signals that there's a fall guy, there's somebody to blame. And if that person has gotten rid of and somebody new is brought in, then things can get better. Um, but the policy direction overall, the, the signs about the policy direction overall aren't yet indicating that things can get better in a significant way. Um, this person does have a considerable amount of experience. Wu Ching is his name. Um, and it, it could be that he brings in uh, a policy direction that, that does help. But again, the focus on national security as opposed to economic development and growth makes that really difficult. There's a real question about what's behind some of the weakness. People are talking about idiosyncratic factors like pork prices. Other people talking about international trade, especially as the trade deficit in the U.S. fell quite considerably uh, yesterday in data that came out. How much is a diversification away from China by the U.S., by Europe, part of what's behind the weakness? I mean, I do think that that is uh, a fair thing to point to because we know that there's been weak hiring in the manufacturing sector. And, you know, weak hiring leads to weak income growth, which leads to weak demand. But it's not just the manufacturing sector that has had weak hiring. It's also the services sectors. It's the construction sectors. So uh, it's bigger than just the, the lack of demand from developed markets that normally would be spending more on Chinese imports. Um, I think also, you know, there's the fact, of course, that there's a weak property market um, and the property market contributes about 10% of China's GDP. There's not anything, uh, any sector that really uh, can fill in that gap. And there's, there's no chance of the property market uh, rebounding to what it was before. Anna, we have uh, just wrapped up meetings in China between Chinese officials and U.S. officials, this working group. They're talking about a number of things, uh, tariffs, two-way investment restrictions, sanctions against Chinese companies. Do you expect anything to come from these meetings? 
I think the meetings themselves are important. The communication is important. Uh, what will come from the meetings, that's a little bit harder to tell. Uh, I think that the meetings do help to signal uh, from one side to the other what the major issues are. And um, we know that the U.S. side has been raising industrial policy in China as one of its issues. Uh, the economy is heavily reliant on industrial policy today, more so than it was pre-COVID. Um, and that is raising concerns in the United States and elsewhere about overcapacity and potential dumping of things like Chinese electric vehicles onto the U.S. market and other markets, undermining the ability of those markets to develop their own domestic industries in those sectors. Um, and I think that this is going to continue to be a problem because, of course, you know, this is one of the ways to generate jobs and, and get consumer spending again is to throw money into these emerging strategic sectors. But it also has negative trade implications. When you look at potentially the upcoming U.S. election and it's going to be Biden or Trump most likely, how does China prepare for that? Because I actually heard one analyst say that China is more concerned with Biden because he takes a multilateral approach against Beijing, while Trump just goes for a Beijing versus Washington. What, what is your take on that? Who is China actually more concerned about? So this is a really interesting question. And I don't think that we know the answer um, definitively as to who China is more concerned about. I don't think that there's, there's a clear answer as to who China would prefer, um, although there's lots of speculation around that. It is, it is fair to say that Biden has taken uh, a much stronger multilateral approach. That's been much more of an emphasis for him during his, you know, three and a half years in office um, or 3.25 years in office. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Trump wouldn't take a multilateral approach. He certainly was pretty unilateral in his approach to the trade war at the beginning of his administration. But if you look at the second half of his administration, there was much more of an emphasis on reaching out to partners and allies to coordinate things like export controls, um, I, particularly the effort to try to discourage uh, allowing Huawei into different countries' tech infrastructure. Uh, it's possible that the Trump administration would pick up uh, somewhat from where Biden left off with uh, the multilateral alliances that have been built um, and fostered, but it's not a it's not a certainty. On the other hand, you know, a unilateral Trump is not necessarily an easy Trump uh, for China to deal with at all, just because uh, he makes other nations upset with his trade policy um, and is putting America first, so to speak, doesn't mean that uh, he's predictable or easy to negotiate with. So I, I think I think it remains to be seen. Uh, I guess we'll see how the election pans out. <laughs> Anna, before we get to that election, I'm just wondering, what advice are you giving companies right now trying to operate in China? I'll pick out an example, say Apple, in the last couple of weeks struggling in China, one part foreign exchange, one part increased competitors on the ground, but also there's a sense of rising nationalism in the consumer that's maybe pushing back against foreign brands. What's your advice to those companies operating there? I mean, every company that has major operations in China and cares about being able to compete effectively in the China market, um, but is dealing with the geopolitical realities that are not going to change anytime soon, the tension between the United States and China, um, is diversifying and trying to make sure that they're not over, overly dependent on China. Uh, that takes more time for some industries than others. It certainly is taking more time for Apple than it would um, for for a company with a, a simpler supply chain. Um, but I, you know, I think the reality is that if you want to be a successful company globally these days, you still have to be successful in China. And so most of those companies are trying to stay in China um, in order to compete there, the in China for China policy. And um, there's no reason to tell them not to at the moment. Anna, appreciate it. Anna Ashton there, if you raise a group on the latest in China. At least it's getting harder to do that, not easier. And this is part of the problem, especially with the election coming up and especially with some of the uh, uncertainties. This is why I'm curious what Disney has to say about that. A Disney CFO coming up a little bit later this morning. Let's get you an update on the top stories elsewhere today. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Shares in PayPal are lower in the pre-market trade. The company forecasts little profit growth for the full year. The company's disappointing first quarter and 2024 outlook overshadowed fourth quarter earnings that did beat estimates. PayPal announced last month that it's going to cut 9% of its workforce as it continues to trim costs and streamline operations.
Disney announced it's taken a one and a half billion dollar stake in Fortnite maker Epic Games. The deal allows a video game maker to use popular Disney properties like Star Wars, Marvel and Avatar. The collaboration marks Disney's biggest entry into the world of video games after shuttering its international operations for games in 2016. Weight loss drug maker Ozempic continues to cause concern for snack food companies. Nova Nordisk CEO Lars Fugergaard Jorgensen says he's been receiving calls from other CEOs, adding, quote, they're scared about it. Jorgensen wouldn't disclose any names, but says the conversation centered around how the drugs work and how fast they would roll out. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Danny, thank you. Let's name them. I don't know the names. <laughs> we could. We could probably name them, right? It's the gift that keeps giving this story. Well, what's interesting is when you talk to the CFOs of these companies, they say it's not going to have any impact. This is overstated. The fact that they're having private conversations oh, yeah. with Novo Nordisk saying, but just tell them. How quickly is the rollout going to be? Exactly. How many people? How, how quickly is the rollout going to be in America? Yeah. You're going to be able to increase production that fast? Can you slow down a little bit? <laughs> or just give people still a taste for certain types of foods. Sure. Can you do that? Just do a little sprinkle of this and make sure they still like Pepsi. <laughs> but, oh, whoa. Just, I'm just theoretically. Saying, for example. Yes, exactly. For example, mm. snacks, whatever, more generic. I'm next on the program, Disney, turning a corner. Just one year ago, we outlined an ambitious plan to return to a period of sustained growth this past quarter demonstrates we have turned the corner and entered a new era. They've turned the corner. That conversation up next, live from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Don't miss this, it's a must watch. A little bit later on today, 7.30 Eastern Time, Hugh Johnson, CFO of the Walt Disney Company. Under surveillance this morning, Disney turning a corner. Just one year ago, we outlined an ambitious plan to return to a period of sustained growth and shareholder value creation. And our strong performance this past quarter demonstrates we have turned the corner and entered a new era. Looking at the renewed strength of our businesses this quarter, from sports to entertainment to experiences, the stage is now set for significant growth and success. So here's the latest. Disney climbing in pre-market trading after beating expectations driven by cost cuts and strength in theme parks. The company also raising its forecast for streaming, expecting to turn a profit by the fall. Geetha Raghunath, the media analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us now for more. Geetha, I know that's where you want to focus, so let's go straight there. The streaming business. Are they being too conservative with that guide based on what you're hearing from that company? Yes, so, uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, good morning, John. So with the streaming business, I think what they really had to demonstrate was that this business can get to profitability, can get to profitability fast. And I think they did exactly that uh, with the most recent quarter. So analysts expecting about $400 million in losses. They came in significantly below, just about $140 million or so. So definitely they are on track. And, you know, they did lose some subscribers in the business, so that was slightly disconcerting, but that's going to reverse. That's going to reverse in this quarter with that new charter agreement that they have in place. So as we kind of look ahead to this company, I know they already guided to about 20% EPS growth. They're anchored by their parks business, which is, again, performing really strongly. But if you look at the biggest earnings growth driver, I think that is definitely going to be the streaming business. Gator, I've got some questions about Mr. Nelson Peltz. Mr. Iger didn't want to talk about him. But did you get the sense that every time Mr. Riger spoke, he was actually talking directly to Mr. Peltz? I mean, you know, this has kind of been a distraction and kind of an overhang on, you know, the Disney management team, uh, the, all of the activists, investors. And I think, you know, yesterday, uh, Mr. Iger really came out swinging, right? He, he's back with a bang. I mean, he delivered, uh, he was on a roll in terms of all the things that he delivered, not just with the financial results, not just with the execution, but also in terms of strategy. You have that one-two punch that they have with their streaming product, right? You have this super app that's coming out this fall. You have the ESPN standalone that's coming out next year. So I really don't know what more there is that, you know, Disney can do. And, and they know the business better than anybody else. And I think Bob Iger is completely right when he says that. I mean, no other activist or outsider knows the 
the business better, knows the brand better. Uh, and this is really un an unnecessary kind of distraction and interference for them. So let's, Geetha, talk about the brand and exactly where the growth will come from in the streaming business, given the fact that they don't want to invest in content. And there are real questions about how they are going to spin off or monetize their ESPN offering. Where do you see the growth coming from? So they're doing, I think, a lot of different things for, for, for growth. Uh, so one was obviously that that investment that they have in Epic Games, which is a little bit tangential, but I think that is you know, definitely an investment for future growth. And even with the ESPN streaming app, yes, one part of it is definitely a defensive move, but I think they can, ultimately they're kind of looking at this to add to the bundle. I mean, this is the beginning of the great content rebundling, right? So you have the ESPN standalone, you have the super app. They're really looking to reclaim all of those uh, people who kind of cut the cord. And we have 30 million cord cutters which is obviously going to get even worse with this new streaming app. But I, I think they think that it can definitely be a new, uh, you know, kind of growth area for them. And then, of course, you have the parks business, which is they're investing heavily uh, in that to, to grow that as well. So I think there are a lot of growth drivers that they have. Of course, the linear networks is kind of going to be a, a constant overhang for them. There is a question, though, about what kind of price you're talking about with the ESPN app and the spinoff with this uh, consortium. Do we have a sense of what kind of revenues they're hoping to get, what kind of pricing there could be? Yeah, so I think there have been some, uh, there has been some speculation about that super app, the one that's coming out this fall, uh, along with Fox and, and Warner Brothers, being somewhere in the $40 to $50 range, which kind of makes sense. Again, it's going to be interesting to see whether people would really subscribe to that. I think it's still a fairly compelling proposition. I mean, you're not going to get everything. You still will need, you know, Paramount Plus. You still will need Peacock for kind of that whole suite of NFL programming and some more sports. But just that super app itself does give you about 50, 60 percent of all the sports content that you want to watch in the United States. So I think it's, it's still a pretty compelling proposition. In terms of the pricing for the new ESPN standalone app, they really didn't give us much color on that. Obviously, it will have to be less than that super app. So I'm thinking maybe around a $25 price point. But again, that app is going to be a little different in terms of uh, you know, the functionality that it offers, because I think they're trying to integrate sports betting uh, and a lot of more interactive features in that app. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot, a lot is going to come down to pricing and then you know, subsequently demand. Gita, I'm just a little bit confused on ESPN. So in 2025, they're going to have the ESPN streaming service that's different than the ESPN Plus, what they currently have, on top of a bundle with Fox and Warner. Which one should they really be throwing all of their eggs into? Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I think this has been a little bit of a head scratcher, right? We don't know whether the ESPN standalone is going to cannibalize, uh, you know, the super app or, or how exactly it's going to work. But I think ultimately what Disney is really looking to do is, is make, you know, aggregation at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the day is the holy grail. And Disney knows that. Disney knows that bundling is really, really important. I mean, if you just look at their streaming bundle, I mean, this is the most popular bundle out there in the marketplace. 40 to 50% of all their subscribers take the bundle, so they know it works. And they want to offer different things, so different flavors of that, right? You have, the, you have the super app with content from different providers. You, of course, have then the ESPN Plus app, maybe for the hardcore fan who wants to get into betting, who wants to get into more kind of these interactive features. So I think at the end of the day, you, you have that base bundle, and then they're going to be able to offer all of these different flavors with, you know, kind of up-tiering and upselling uh, possibilities. Okay, so did they give us a price yesterday? They did not give us a price, no. S still waiting for a price and a name, I think. Geetha, thank you. Geetha Rakanathan there of Bloomberg Intelligence. Lisa, that's a question for the CFO a little bit later this morning. And everybody, they decided a price. Yeah, well, and everybody's sort of gaming out $40 to $50. Let's find out from him the details. He's going to tell us all. I don't think he's going to Didn't get the 40 price. from nowhere, did we? No. Feels like 40 to 50. Does that sound about right? I mean, it seems like everyone's kind of coalescing around that, so it gives them a free pass. Question is, how much do they expect to earn from this, given uh, what the distribution is likely to be and how much revenue sharing there has to be? Does this feel like a Hail Mary to you, like quickly thrown together? This is going to launch in four. We don't have a price or a name yet. You know what I find interesting? Raptor. They didn't. <laughs> well, it might be. Well, but they didn't tell any of the sports teams. Yeah, and the Washington Journal. And I, yeah, and I, and I wonder what kind of animosity there is from some of them saying, whoa, hold on a second. Yep. What exactly are you doing and how could this potentially affect us? Sports rights, how yeah. expensive or not they're going to be exactly. in the future off the back of a deal like this. So Disney is positive in the pre-market, has been 
all morning. Your broader equity market is lower by 0.2% on the S&P. Coming up next in the next hour, here's the lineup for you. Dan Greenhouse of Solace Asset Management, Justin Slatsky of Schenkman Capital, Christina Campmany of Invesco, and Disney CFO Hugh Johnston. All of that and a whole lot more from New York City this morning. Good morning. The next hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. We still think recession risk is potentially out there, but we think it's not the base case at this point. I think we need a little more data to be really confident ourselves that, you know, we're going to avoid this recession. You don't know if you're going to go into recession until you actually go into recession. We do see a soft patch coming in this economy during the middle part of the year. There's some validity to saying that, hey, if things are going well, they're just going to continue to do so. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. This hour, cruise lines. <laughs> Stay tuned from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Bramitz together with Amory Hordern. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market is negative by 0.16% on the S&P. Certainly not negative yesterday. Very, very close, Lisa, to 5K. And it was driven by the Magnificent Seven and some others as well. There is a feeling that things are going to go well, even if the Fed doesn't cut rates sooner. There's enough momentum to kind of keep things going and for upside surprise to be the biggest risk to so many different investment. Now and again, we play this game. If I had told you earlier this year, would you have guessed? So let's play that right now. If I had told you earlier this year that the data would still look pretty decent, payrolls would be a blowout, ISM services would be really strong, prices paid would start picking up, manufacturing would threaten to go back into expansion and the Federal Reserve would push back against this idea they're going to cut anytime soon. Would you have the S&P of 5,000? Would you have high yield spreads where they are right now at about 320? I would have crushed the call. I would have been absolutely right. No, of course, I'd be hiding in a bunker thinking that we were going to go into gloom and doom. This question of, you know, what is driving the economy? Where are we in some of the cycle? Are we early cycle? Are we late cycle? Still a big question mark. That said, volatility is picking up at the same time that you're seeing a rally. This is something Julian Emanuel pointed to, and he said that that hasn't happened before very frequently, usually before a decline. It does feel like the doom and gloom, though, is getting absolutely buried to yeah, start the year. As I, I often say, this is an observation about where we are, not a judgment on the future. Lisa can get into that in a moment. But let's take the 10-year auction yesterday. Huge, $42 billion of 10-year notes coming to market. Is it going to be a problem? No problem. Tons of demand. And how many people have pushed back on the idea that the deficit's even a problem? They talk about the fact that uh, essentially it has never been that issue and people are looking to lock in yield. If you can get four uh, point something percent yield for 10 years, a lot of people will take it. It matters uh, when it does. And until then, people kind of move on. And it's not going to matter this year because it's an election year. But the Fed chair, Jay Powell, in 60 Minutes said when he was asked, is it urgent? He said, yeah, I think we could pretty much say it's urgent. And those CBO projections yesterday show that our debt level is now exceeding, a, it's going back to a record, exceeding World War II era levels. This is a huge issue. So let's talk to Secretary Yellen. So she went in front of the House Financial Services Committee earlier the week. She's going to go in front of the Senate Banking Committee today. today. Are we going to talk about these issues or are we just going to be talking about what's happening in credit, what's happening with the banks, the smaller lenders in this country? I think given what we saw yesterday with some of these commercial real estate with the New York Community Bank, she is going to be asked once again about is this idiosyncratic or is this going to have systemic risk? Potentially some Republicans, though, are going to want to point to the fiscal debt. The issue is whether or not it's Biden or Trump, you're going to get an increase in the U.S. Uh, debt. We're not on a sustainable path. Even when it comes to the Trump era tax cuts, Biden wants to keep some of those in place for those making $400,000 or lower. I feel like right now when you have hearings in Washington, everyone in the market's hearing blah, 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 unless there's some kind of policy prescription. And really, in general, the macro story has been a lot of blah, 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 because all of the gloom and doomers have been wrong. And so people are looking at specific stories and specific churns and trying to understand those and tuning out the blah, blah, blah. This is not personal for you at all. You're so <laughs> dumb. With Washington. It's amazing to me because, Lisa, it is February 8th. And I you've know. got nine more months of this. <laughs> I know. I've got to nine. change my tune. I'm going to come around. I'm going to. I want to know policy. And they're not you. talking about I policy. Can't help you. It's going to get worse. I know. But I want to talk policy. And, and the problem is there's just a complete dearth of it in any kind of con uh, serious way. You have, and, you have to get through the politics to then get to the policy. 
fast forward. <laughs> fast forward. Let's fast forward now. <laughs> Equities right now on the S&P 500, negative by 0.1% on the S&P. Very close. I think within five points of 5,000 at a close yesterday on the S&P 500. Equity futures now down by 0.16%. Yields are going somewhere up about a basis point. No big moves here. 413. We talked a little bit about the 10-year auction yesterday. 30-year bond auction today. $25 billion worth a little bit later on this afternoon. In the FX market, the euro just a touch weaker. Negative here by 0.1%. 107.63 on the euro against the dollar. Coming up this hour, Dan Greenhouse of Solace Alternative Asset Management as stocks hit new record highs. Justin Slatke of Schenkman Capital on distressing commercial real estate. And later on, about 7.30 Eastern time, don't miss this, the Disney CFO, Hugh Johnston, on the company's blockbuster earnings and future partnerships too. We begin with our top story, the S&P 500 closing in on 5K. Julian Emanuel of Evercore ISI with a warning. The move to the round number, or 5,000, increases the likelihood of sustained volatility in both directions. It's a mix of FOMO <laughs> and fear. Dan Greenhouse, Chief Strategist at Solace Alternative Asset Management, joins us now for more. Dan, good morning to you. Good morning to you, sir. Is it a collision of FOMO and fear in this market right now? It's been a, we were talking about this off air. It's been a collision of FOMO and fear for 15 or 20 years now. And I think when uh, th this idea that the fear component of it now, and it's always something, the fear component of it now is that all this is being driven by just seven stocks. And admittedly, when 30% of market cap, 25 to 30% of market cap is seven stocks, we should say six, Tesla's quickly finding its way outside of that. But uh, 20, 25% of, of index net income is driven by seven stocks. It's impossible for them to perform as well as they have and not be the bulk of the performance. But if you look outside of those seven names, I can give you dozens of stocks doing incredibly well. If it's just seven stocks, pull up a chart of United Rentals, pull up a chart of the hotel companies. Um, the cruise lines. The cruise lines. Pull up a chart of, of if, if healthcare is all Eli Lilly, really hilarious you are. Just um, uh, pull up a chart of Merck if, if healthcare is all Eli Lilly. These are, there's any number of these stocks. And on the industrial side of things, look at a chart of like Eaton. Uh, it's not just seven stocks. There's other themes that you can play as an investor beyond those names that are helping drive gains, uh, again, not exclusive to, those, to, to technology. Perhaps credit is more instructive in that regard because we're not just talking about seven names in credit. That's right. The whole credit market seems to be doing pretty well. Had a ton of supply to start the year. Demand looks pretty tidy too. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. I mean, listen, it, 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 the, you would look at uh, enthusiasm in the equity market in the form of P.E. ratios. Uh, in the credit market, you look at it in the form of spreads. And, and in IG, you have spread sub 100 basis points right now. As you mentioned in the intro, in high yield, you're talking 325 or so, depending on your index. Those are pretty tight levels uh, that suggest that on balance, the credit markets aren't particularly concerned right now. But again, that's not telling you anything that the equity market isn't telling you uh, in the form of either trading at 20 times forward earnings or just the enthusiasm around the market in general. I wish that we could zoom in on your tie so we could really understand uh, what's on there. It's a helicopter with money coming wait, out of we, it. This is Bloomberg and we, have ca we can zoom in. All right, well, let's zoom in. <laughs> we have advanced in. technology. <laughs> well, thank you, I appreciate it. There is um, a helicopter, Bernanke, with helicopter money the coming prob out. The problem with doing this is yeah. the fact that it's Bernanke <laughs> and not Yellen or Jay Powell is dating my time. Okay, but, all right, and so let's move past the, the dating. How much is this part of the story, that essentially the helicopter cash is still sloshing around and making people want to go on cruise lines. I, I have generally been uh, suspicious of the idea that this is all because of free money. Um, you don't have the breadth of performance over the last 15 years, the improvement in earnings purely because of the Federal Reserve. And I just, it's been a theme that I've rejected for, for 15, 20 years, and I continue to do so today. That's not to say that central bank and easy money or low interest rates can't be beneficial. It, of course, can. But the idea that everything everywhere is solely the result of uh, uh, stimulus checks or money being thrown out of helicopters is an idea I just I wholly reject. There is a sort of curiosity, though, in the market, especially for someone who focuses on credit. We thought that there would be some real zombies that would be rooted out and killed off by higher rates. Sure. We have higher rates. They're not being rooted out and killed off. Well, some are. OK, but who? I mean, we're not seeing a lot of distress. Party City. OK, Party City. But I'm just talking about we're not seeing some massive defaults. No, that's right. You have to, you have to go deep into the well if I'm pulling out Party City and, uh, and Serta Simmons. That's right. There's not widespread distress. Now, listen, there are reasons for that beyond, quote, unquote, easy money, although the excessively low interest rates that prevailed in the post-COVID environment allowed a lot of riskier companies to term out their debt 
uh, the so-called maturity wall doesn't really hit until next year, and this has been something that we've known for a couple of years, but companies have to start addressing that maturity wall, call it 12 to 18 months before the maturities actually come due. So sometime starting now, let's say, a lot of these companies are going to have to start refining. And you've seen this already. You mentioned this uh, in the intro in terms of the, I, I think John did, in terms of the, the amount of uh, issuance that's coming to market. Uh, you're going to have to start addressing this issue. And, and, uh, but, but that aside, there is no indication that you cannot address these issues. You may have to pay more, and certainly the spread between the effective yield on your debt and coupon is pretty wide, which means interest expense is probably going to go up, which is going to pressure interest coverage ratios for sure. But I don't think as long as the economy expands, this is a problem for certainly not the IG market and probably not the high yield market either. Can we talk about one part of credit that everyone's focused on at the moment, which is commercial real estate? We seem to have worked through or still working through a rate shock of the last 18 months. I think we're all still worried about whether we get a credit one this year and whether that's going to be in commercial real estate. You talked about some of the things coming due. We know some things are coming due in that particular part of the market. Yeah, listen, we don't spend too much time on this. What I'll say is that Barry Sternlich made some headlines the other day talking down to Florida saying this is a $3 trillion market that probably has a trillion of losses or something. Uh, far be it for me to take issue with anything Barry Sternlich says, sure. but I will say of the $3 trillion, a good chunk of it is multifamily, a chunk of it is farmland. By the time you're done slicing this up, you're probably down to two trillion, and that's still a lot, and there are still losses to be taken. But there's also delineations between suburban office and central business and what we'll call class ABC. Midtown Manhattan office space that has a gym and a laundromat in it is going to do much better than something out of the central business district. And you can expand that out to, to other regions throughout the country as well. Um, listen, I, look at the charts of SL Green and, and Boston Properties. I think sentiment had gotten incredibly poor in the space. Uh, I, I don't have any particular insight into when these losses are going to be taken, although they probably will be taken. But I think the performance of the equities, at least now, tells you that people are starting to get a little, uh, their heads are wrapped around the, the extent of the losses. This is what we're trying to figure out, Lisa, whether it's single names, couple of lenders, whether it's a whole sector, whether it ultimately becomes a broader market issue. And the consensus at the moment seems to be the first but and, real, and I'm not sorry the last. To interrupt. Sure, please. Getting back to the fear and the FOMO, the concern about everything is that it becomes a broader issue, whether it's the debt and the deficit or the dysfunction in Washington or the Fed's balance sheet or commercial real estate or Ozempic and its effect on this, that, and the next thing. It's The concern is always that it becomes a broader issue. And the truth is, most times, it does not become a broader issue. And this is, on, like, this is not rocket science. Most of the time, public risk markets go up. And they go up because the meteor doesn't always hit the earth. Should I be concerned that you're a credit guy who focuses on distress? and that you're just incredibly bullish and just dismissing all well, the doom and gloom? It's not that I'm incredibly bullish. There are certainly, there are losses to be taken, but I'm also, I think, and, and everyone should be this way, I am a realist. I don't think I'm a bullish or a, a bull or a bear. At any given moment in time, the facts are X, and X means Y for your risk, land, for, for your risk environment and your portfolio allocation. And I don't think anybody should be slavishly bullish or bearish. And I'll, just to toot my own horn here for a second, for I was it. bearish for most of 22 into early 23. But then the facts started to change. The recession that I and a lot of other people thought was going to happen increasingly looked like it like it wouldn't. We discussed this on air a couple of times. You don't remember. And, and <laughs> I you, remember. No, you have many esteemed guests, and I'm one of many. But. Um, uh, Don't give me enough credit. The, the facts started changing in early 23, and a lot of people remained bearish uh, despite the change in those facts. But I, I, again, I think there are a few of us that said, well, wait a second, this doesn't seem to be happening. What does that mean for my positioning? So it's not that I'm a distressed guy who's particularly bullish. It's that the data is telling me to be risk on, for lack of a better word. If that changes, and it might, uh, then obviously your positioning and your, and your view has to change as well. This is why I think the Fed is increasingly more relevant now, because ultimately the Fed matters for the following reason. Do they have the ability to respond to negative shocks? I think the chairman told us last week that he has the ability to react to negative shocks. And unlike 12 months ago, where if anyone talked about the market rallying, he'd give you his hawkish hits in the news conference, that's not where they're at anymore. They'll embrace the strength and they can respond, in their words, they can react to weaker data if they need to. And they have a lot more ammunition after hiking rates as much as they have. And I think that, that people are looking at that and saying, oh, what a change five it's years makes. It's a huge shift. It's a yeah. massive shift. Dan, it's good to see you. You're always my pleasure. Congratulations yes, for phenomenal calls in 2022 and 2023. We've been following yeah, closely. I'm reminded, very quick, I'm reminded of uh, when Ben Bernanke went on Colbert's show to put out his book. Colbert said, how courageous of you to call the book The Courage to Act. <laughs> and it's good to see you.
nothing. In we'll leave that there. Of Solis Alternative <laughs> Asset Management. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Israel and the U.S. are split on a proposed response by Hamas to pause fighting and release dozens of hostages. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has seemingly rejected the proposal. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told reporters that Hamas's response, quote, creates space for agreement. The U.S. has sought to ease the fighting in the Middle East since Hamas's attack on October 7th. Demand for rental properties in Manhattan surged by 14% in January, keeping rents higher during the traditionally quiet winter period. Don't I know it? The median price for new leases was at $4,150, up one and a third percent from January of last year. That's still lower, though, than July's record-setting median price of $4,440 a month. New Yorkers have been seizing on the slight decline in costs from the summer peak. Cristiano Ronaldo is the highest paid athlete in the world. He's taking home $275 million in 2023 thanks to off-field endorsements and a lucrative contract in Saudi Arabia. A new list from Sportico found golfer John Rahm, basketballer LeBron James, and footballers Lionel Messi and Kylian Mbappe rounding out the top five. Tiger Woods still came in at 14th with $80 million in earnings despite playing just three events and taking home less than $200,000 in prize money last year. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Danny, thank you. I just love that Tiger doesn't even need to try. Up next on the program, is commercial real estate posing a problem? Commercial real estate isn't worth what it used to be. The good news is it's a problem, but it's not a surprise. So everybody saw this coming, so it's baked into the rates. A conversation coming up next, live from New York. This is Bloomberg. My name is Nikolai Costa Waldau, and I believe this moment in time will be when we started to transform the way we live to inform the future we want. Let's go to a cooler place. This show is about solutions and the people behind them. The worm that can actually dissolve plastic. This will be a carbon neutral jet fuel. This is an optimist's guide to the planet. It's Jimmy Lannister on <laughs> the room bay. <laughs> Two hours, 12 minutes away from the opening bell in New York City this morning. Good morning to you. Equities are doing all right. We're negative 0.1% on the S&P 500. Yields are higher by a single basis point. Your 10-year, 4.13. Had a ton of issuance at a 10-year yesterday. Really strong demand. 30-year supply coming up a little bit later on this afternoon. That's the scene for you. Cross-asset under surveillance this morning is commercial real estate posing a problem. Commercial real estate isn't worth what it used to be because people aren't going into the office. The good news is it's a problem, but it's not a surprise. So everybody saw this coming. So it's baked into the rates. Like, and you're, you're seeing it play out in the numbers right now. We're discussing that. But um, this isn't going to come as some you know, like pandemic-like surprise where all of a sudden it knocks the world economy over because we didn't see it coming. So here's the latest. Regional banks' exposure to commercial real estate once again weighing on investors. New York Community Bank shares have been plunging over the last week after the bank said it was stockpiling cash for troubled loans tied to CRE, prompting some fears about a repeat of last year's banking issues in the United States. Justin Slackey, the CIO of Schenkman Capital, joins us now to discuss this and a whole lot more. Justin, good morning to you. Good morning, Jonathan. Thanks Usually for having me. Usually we say CRE around this table and a lot of people say there's not much to see here. What do you say back to the issues that are emerging over the last couple of weeks? I think in the regional bank space, that's going to be a tough place to invest for an extended period of time. Commercial real estate is going to take years to play out. Uh, you know, with what we just saw with NYCB, they have a particular issue where they have exposure to Manhattan. And 20% of their portfolio is in rent-stabilized houses. As those mortgages roll off and they have to pay higher for mortgages and they can't change the revenue side, that's gonna squeeze margins. That takes time to play out. And if they didn't grow over a hundred billion, we probably wouldn't even know about that problem. It's the fact that the hundred billion dollar number was hit, regulation stepped in and all of a sudden they had to take higher reserves. So these problems are throughout the regional banks. It's just will take time to play out because there's no catalyst to really drive most of them to, to lower their uh, valuations. This raises a question when you take a step back, and it's something we were just talking about uh, with Dan Greenhouse. How do you sort of figure out what's priced in and what's not? Right? We were hearing from Jim McKelvey yesterday, everyone knows this. We've been worried about this forever. So how do you know 
whether people are accurately pricing the risk or whether there is something more significant that will justify the gloomers and the doomers? Unfortunately, you don't know contagion until it happens. When Bear Stearns happened, you would have thought that would have been contagion, as it, and it wasn't. And because it wasn't, you would have thought Lehman Brothers wouldn't have been contagion, and it was. And so, unfortunately, you don't know it until you see it. The reality is we know commercial real estate is a real problem unless there's a catalyst that drives valuation you're not going to see it go broader into the marketplace. So we do have some maturities coming up that will create forced marks. As that happens, you'll see a few banks probably struggle in here, but it probably still stays under the radar for the overall marketplace. How much is private credit kind of masking a lot of problems right now, both in commercial real estate but beyond with respect to the credit space? The yeah, private credit has had an interesting impact on the public markets because as they've raised a lot of capital, they've been able to, they've been willing to finance companies that have been unable to get financing in the public markets. So companies that might have gone bankrupt previously, and so you would have already seen bankruptcy rates start to increase, have not because private credit has stepped in and been willing to take on that risk. That's had two impacts. One, bankruptcy rates are lower. Two, the risk has moved into private hands as opposed to public hands. So we don't see those price movements as much as we might have uh, in previous marketplaces. Justin, there's always something to worry about. That was a theme of the program so far yeah. this morning. Last year, it was navigating the rate shock that was going through small and medium sized lenders, regional banks in the United States. And I think there's still an obsession over credit risk. There just is a belief that it's got to happen. There's got to be a credit problem somewhere. We surely can't escape going from zero to 5.5 on Fed funds without one. Are we seeing them beneath the surface? You talk about these rolling issues in credit. That it's not all at once, it's just from sector to sector at different times. Is that how you're framing things? Yeah, and I think we are starting to see that underneath the overall market. We're seeing it in individual industries and we're seeing it in areas of investment. So in industries, if you look at uh, the cable industry, that's down 5% year to date in the high yield market. If you look at telecom services, that's down 3%. That's in a market where equities are doing really well and high yield is positive. You're also seeing it in more broader investments. So VC investing and private equity are two of the areas that benefited the most from the low rate environment. VC is having trouble with their valuations. PE is not able to monetize their, their credits and their names, and that's why they're holding on to investments longer. They're the ones where you're seeing it first. As we move forward, what's going to happen in a higher rate environment is we're going to move from what's been a beta market for the last decade, all macro oriented, to a much more idiosyncratic, fundamental market. And we think we're in that transition now. And telco and cable is just an example of Let's that. Let's get into that then. What do you like right now? What are you doing? What do you like? So it's amazing you've had two credit people on in a row because nobody wanted to talk to credit people for the last decade. So I'm excited that we have yield in the credit markets and it's worth uh, talking about the asset class. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, uh, uh, so I'm really excited about that uh, because people want to talk to us. And I think if you look at the overall high yield market, you know, between seven and a half, eight percent, that hits a lot of bogeys for investors as a place to go to get interest income. Now, remember, you're not talking about necessarily total capital appreciation, but the overall asset class can now provide some real return to clients. That being said, you have to be really careful about where you take that risk because as we're starting to see, you are seeing dispersion among industries and we think you can see a lot of dispersion among the credit markets. Are you hearing from people you haven't heard from in something like 15 years, 20 years? Globally, yes. Isn't that's that true. amazing? We've left behind the era of negative interest rates and all of a sudden incomes back in the right places. I just keep thinking about that beer goggle uh, comment from uh, the head of the uh, Dallas Fed back in 2013. I remember that speech, Fisher. I, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I just, I love it because it basically highlighted this feeling of why is my high yield bond offering 4.9%? Sure. That's yeah. absolutely outrageous. And now we can say it's not. It's we were talking about income inequities, do you remember? And oh, capital yeah. returns in bonds. Yeah. That was like the last 10 years justifying that mess. And now it's the opposite, although it's interesting to me that so many stocks, so many companies are now having to do dividends and buybacks and all that. They're trying to compete with the you know, credit guys. Justin, we've got a lot to talk about. Please to say you're going to stick with us.
Thanks, Thanks for being with us. Justin Slackley there, sticking with us for the rest of this hour. Coming up very shortly, Disney CFO, Hugh Johnston on the company's blockbuster earnings and its plan to rebundle sports. All of that and a whole lot more in the next 30 minutes or so. Your equity market on the S&P 500 recovering off session lows. We're down by 0.13% on the S&P and bond yields just a little bit higher, up by a single basis point. The 10-year, 413. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, equities pulling back on the S&P by 0.1%. Just a small, mild move lower on the Nasdaq down by 0.15. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year shaping up as follows. Yields just a little bit higher by a single basis point on a 10-year yesterday. $42 billion of 10-year notes came to market. Pretty decent demand today. $25 billion of 30-year bonds. Yields higher on the 30-year. The long end of the curve up by two basis points, 434 88. Turn to foreign exchange, push those high yields through this FX market. Dollar just a touch stronger. Euro a little bit weaker, 107.57. We're negative on that currency pair by 0.14%. Under surveillance this morning, your top stories. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer expecting widespread support for today's vote on an aid package for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. Now that it's divorced from U.S. border funding, a bill featuring both aid and new border restrictions was abandoned by Republicans last night. Even if the new deal makes it through the Senate, it's still unlikely to pass in the House. Now, anne this is where we were about two weeks ago or something like that. We were talking about how we needed to put border aid in this package with aid for Ukraine and Israel. And now we're talking about stripping it back out and going back to the beginning again. Plan B is plan A again. And I will say Senator Schumer left the floor yesterday saying, I'm going to recess to, quote, give our Republican colleagues the night to figure themselves out. It was Republicans for months. If you go back, they had this deal on the floor and it was voted down because Republicans say not a dime to foreign aid until we fix our southern border. Now the southern border has become a hot political topic ahead of November. And now it's OK, I guess we have to do the foreign aid, but without fixing the southern border. Given how the last hour went, I'm not even going to ask you Good, about any of this. Let's turn to China. <laughs> Pressure okay? mounting on China's government to provide further economic stimulus, with the country's consumer prices falling at the fastest pace since 2009. CPI dropping 0.8% in January, exceeding economists' estimates. PPI falling 2.5%, marking 16 strength months of deflation for the price of goods when they leave the factory. Very different conversation in China over the last year compared to, say, the U.S. and Europe. Yeah, a couple questions. What can they actually do? Cut rates to zero? OK, cut rates a little bit. I don't know. These are some of the things that people are speculating about. Two, a new person in charge of the Plunge Protection Patrol. And this sort of is interesting because it's sort of, you know, what's a, a change of personnel going to do at, at the time when they really need to come up with a policy that can kind of support things in a more fundamental way? I thought we called them the national team. Not the plunge protection control team. Well, I mean, the national team in China. Well, I mean, the national team could be a lot of things. You know, national football, national, True. you know, lots of things. Stocks protection that. and exactly. all of that stuff as well. So. That's the latest in China. Here's the latest with Disney. Shares rising after an upbeat profit outlook from the company, citing cost-cutting benefits and performance of its international theme parks. In a string of announcements, Disney saying it will invest $1.5 billion in collaboration with the maker of video game Fortnite. It is also partnering with Fox and Warner Brothers Discovery to create a new sports streaming platform. There's a lot to discuss with Hugh Johnston, the Disney CFO, who joins us now. Hugh, it's great to catch up with you, sir. We spoke for years in your years at Pepsi. Fantastic to see you in a new seat. Let's just get straight into these numbers if we can. Cost cutting. Can you walk us through where that cost cutting exercise is really biting? Yeah, it, it actually is. And good morning to you, John, and to the team there. Uh, I'm very excited about that, the progress that we've made on cost cutting. To, to be honest, uh, when you do these programs, you're always looking for, is it actually flowing to the bottom line? And what we communicated yesterday was uh, $500 million of saves flowed through to the bottom line. And you can see it in the P&L in the form of margin improvement to the tune of 350 basis points. That's a huge, huge margin jump and something that we've got a lot of confidence in will continue because we're really getting good traction and good momentum on managing our costs more tightly while reinvesting back in the business to drive the top line as well. So, Hugh, you've got a really strong story to tell this morning. The stock is higher as well. I certainly don't want this conversation to drown into a conversation about activists, but I need to ask about Nelson Pouts. Have you spoken to him personally at all since you took on the new role? Yeah, I, I spoke to him a couple of times briefly, not, not recently. Uh, and, and honestly, 
uh, we're just in a very different spot on this. We feel right now like we've got terrific momentum. Uh, Bob and the team have spent the last year uh, both fixing the business and now pivoting to building the business. And you can see it in the results and you can see it in our confidence as well. Uh, the share of purchase that we've communicated, the earnings guidance we've communicated, the increase in the dividend all suggest that we have confidence that we're not only going to be able to do this for the short term, but we're going to be able to do it for multiple years. So uh, honestly, I don't think we need any incremental help. I think we need to keep this management team focused on doing the things it's doing so that we can continue to deliver great results and make progress on the big strategic issues that'll help us emerge from the disruption that's going on in media in a much, much stronger position than we were in before. Hugh, some analysts, including our own in Bloomberg Intelligence, wondering whether you're being too conservative on the outlook for streaming to turn a profit by the fall. Hugh, what would you say back to them this morning? I, I'd say the guidance is, uh, is to do Q4. If we do better, we do better. But the guide is Q4. Hugh, can you give us a name and maybe a price for this bundle, the sports bundle? Everyone's just asking that. $40, $50, call it Spike. Yeah. <laughs> no, we haven't come up with a name for it yet. You know, the, the focus when you do a three-way JV is on how do we make sure that we, we get the operating principles right so that the parties are aligned up front and they're aligned on going and delivering a great product to consumers. And that that's the real focus here is how do we make it easier and reduce friction for the sports fans? So uh, we're going to get to pricing shortly. We'll get to a name at, at some point, I'm sure. But what's most important is I think we're going to deliver a product that's going to make your life a whole lot better if you're a sports consumer. Hugh, do you think that ultimately the idea of a bundle going back to the future and getting people uh, with reduced friction to find their sports team and find the game that they want to watch is going to take eyeballs away from some of the other providers, the cable networks that have traditionally had these contracts? You're going to bid directly on some of these sports rights. Well, I, I think it's going to be targeted more at, at people who either were never in, in the cable bundle or people who had already departed from the cable bundle. You know, at the margins, might there be a little bit of shifting? Yeah, there could be. But to tell you the truth, I don't think sports is going to be the reason that someone makes that shift all by itself. I think there are a lot of factors that weigh into that. From our perspective, we're focused on meeting the fan wherever they choose to be. I don't think we're motivating the fan to move. But if the fan does move, we want to be there because we want ESPN to be everywhere. Hugh, we're super interested in how you're going to bid for those sporting rights. Do you think you might bid for them as a joint venture? How's this going to work in the months and years to come? No, quite the opposite. Uh, we all will be bidding independently. And that, that's something that, that we're quite firm on is that is not the purpose of the venture. The purpose of the venture is purely distribution. It's not about procurement of content. So we'll continue to compete with each other for sports rights, just as we always have. Uh, it'll actually, I think, be a great benefit to the league because it's no different in terms of the way we bid for sports rights. But that reduced friction benefits all of the leagues as well. So I think the leagues will actually be pretty optimistic about this. There was some reporting yesterday that suggested the leagues weren't aware of this joint venture. Q, have you spoken to them? Uh, I, not, I have not personally, but we certainly have as, as the Walt Disney Company. Uh, candidly, when you're putting together a three-way JV and a three-way JV in the media business, trying to keep it uh, private until you get the deal done is challenging enough. To involve more parties, frankly, just would have created, I think, too much risk. So we certainly let them know the moment that we announced it. Hugh, we have lots more questions about the sports and the streaming, and hopefully we can ask you about them. But I do want to shift gears just a bit uh, to Shanghai's Utopia, the idea that the Chinese offerings of Disney did pretty well, actually, were stalwarts, which was surprising because we've heard a lot of uh, a different tone from other U.S. companies. How much are you seeing Disney welcomed in China, despite some of the rhetoric that we've heard out of the Chinese Communist Party? Yeah, we, we're very much welcomed. You know, I, uh, Disney is just sort of a, a beloved brand. It's part of the reason that I came here is it, it truly is an iconic beloved brand, not just in the United States, but really almost everywhere in the world. So uh, the Chinese consumer is very much responding to what's a fabulous park experience, which, by the way, is, uh, has been true in the rest of our international parks as well. Every one of our international parks made money in the quarter and they're all doing extremely well. International parks revenue grew 35 percent. So. I'm very, very optimistic about all the parks outside the U.S., including the park in China. We thought people loved McDonald's and Starbucks as well, but there's been boycotts in certain places against America Inc. And you think of the Walt Disney Company, I think, as the company behind America Inc. all around the world, Hugh. How have you avoided that 
as a company? It's a great question. And in all candor, I'm, I'm so new here. I'm, I'm not sure I can give you a great reason in that regard, other than the fact that as a company, what we're really focused on is just bringing joy to families, right? We're, we're about bringing smile to people's faces or about families coming together. And given that's who we are, I think maybe we tend to be a little bit more immune to that than most. Hugh, it sounds like you've been there years based on that <laughs> response. Hugh Johnson, it's good to hear from you, sir. Thank you very much for being with us. We look forward to catching up with you in the quarters and the years to come. Hugh Johnson there, the Disney CFO. Lisa, a lot to discuss on this company. Yes, I like the fact that they are, he gave some details there about bidding uh, separately on those sports rights. I thought that was interesting. And when it comes to, I can't speak to why Disney's been immune to it. It's just, you know, people love it. And here I am and rah, rah. I mean, look, I, I think that you see some of these brands hanging out there, it still is an open question. The though. way they've navigated this, I think, is really, really impressive. We've got Justin Slackley with us of Shankman Capital around the table. Justin, I know you were interested in some of the questions yes. in that interview, some of the answers as well. How is this going to potentially upend what's happening with cable, with media over the next few years? I thought his answers were really interesting, especially as it relates to cable distribution. Last summer, Disney and Charter got into a big discussion about including streaming rights into Charter's bundle so that clients would stay with Charter. If they have a separate st streaming that just is sports, which we all know sports is the main driver today of what people are looking to watch, how is that, are those negotiations going to happen going forward with distribution between Disney and uh, the cable companies? Uh, it seems like that's going to be a real challenge going forward with this type of transaction moving forward. So just to sort of put a bow on it, does this type of transaction make certain cable companies that have depended on uh, sports revenues uninvestable? I think it's going to be, they're going to really have to see how this plays out in the future because Disney still needs the revenue from the cable companies. So to go totally away from them seems like an unlikely scenario. So I think a, little, a lot more needs to be developed as how Disney is going to react and how the cable companies are going to react to this announcement. Over you the last can tell the leagues are nervous about this based on the reporting that they weren't aware. And you can understand why the companies didn't have those broader conversations. They wanted to keep it confidential until it was announced. The leagues are going to be worried about this because they'll be afraid that once you've got this joint venture, they won't be competing against each other for sports rights in quite the same way. Now, clearly Hugh Johnston's got a view on this, so they'll compete separately and as they always have done. I'm going to be very intrigued to see the outcome, Lisa, of sports auctions in the next few years. And it goes to the point that you were talking about and that Michael Nathanson talked about as well, which is kind of peak sports valuations right now, league Possibly. valuations. Yeah, and that this could really highlight that. The problem they've always had is that you rent the asset and that you don't own it. And the executives talk about this all the time. You spend a fortune acquiring sports rights. You develop massive production around them. You pay a lot of people to present the programs, but ultimately you never own those rights in quite the same way. So you can boost the value of the asset through your own hard work and your own investment. Then in five years down the road, whatever the agreement actually is, you've got to pay up even more to secure those sports rights all over again. I think that's the issue that a lot of these players have had for a long, long time. Whether this joint venture does change it or not, I'm not interested in the objectives. I want to understand the consequences. As a consequence, will they bid as aggressively as they have done in the past, knowing this joint venture exists? That's still an open question. Because ultimately, it's not going to make or break them because they are, their customers will keep be, uh, being able to $40 access a month. that. Exactly, well, potentially. What are we calling it, Spike? Spike. <laughs> Spike at 40 bucks it's a month. Internally, isn't it? It's called Raptor, I think. Raptor? I like Spike. You like Spike. Mm. Where did you get Spike from? You just made that up. It's like very athletic. OK, nice. All right, let's move on. Let's get you an update on stories <laughs> elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Shares in PayPal are lower in the pre-market trade. The company forecasts little profit growth for the full year. The company's disappointing first quarter and 2024 outlook overshadowed fourth quarter earnings that beat estimates. PayPal announced last month it would cut about 9% of its workforce. It continues to trim costs and streamline its operations. Weight loss drug Ozempic continues to cause concern for snack food companies. Nova Norda CEO Lowers for your guard Jorgensen said he's been receiving calls from other CEOs, adding, quote, they are scared about it. Jorgensen wouldn't disclose any names, but said the conversation centered around how the drugs would work and how fast they would roll out. Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont has unveiled plans to challenge New York State's tax rule for remote workers. New York requires workers to pay income tax to the state if their job is based there, even if they work remotely outside state lines. The governor's plan aims to encourage residents to file suits against New York State in order to get tax refunds. Lamont says the proposal could generate over $200 million annually if successful.
And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Hey, Danny. Thank you. Up next on the program, making the case for credit. If the soft landing, and this is key, can the Fed cut early enough, cut enough to get that soft landing? In a soft landing, I think you're supposed to be in credit. That conversation just around a corner, live from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Stocks on the S&P 500 pulling back by, where are we, 0.14% on the S&P. The Nasdaq is a little bit lower as well. Equity futures doing okay. In the bond market, yields are higher by a single basis point, 413.66 on a 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, making the case for credit. If the soft landing, and this is key, can the Fed cut early enough, cut enough to get that soft landing. In a soft landing, I think you're supposed to be in credit. You just have to be really careful, diversify the portfolio, make sure you know what you're buying. It's the latest today. Investors weighing credit risk as Fed officials temper hopes for rate cuts. Christina Campmany of Invesco writing, quote, even with this delayed start to easing, the probability of something breaking in asset markets have diminished significantly with the easing in financial conditions. Christina, I'm pleased to say, joins us around the table. Christina, good to see you. Thanks so much for having me in. Start of the year, we were all told the same thing. Price for perfection. And then everything started rallying. And then we were told we're priced for even more perfection. Then everything continued <laughs> rallying. Where are we now? Look, I think the difference when we look at 23 and how we ended the year and 24, how we're starting, is we're exactly that, how we are priced. And I think it leaves us with U.S. assets in particular, our, our stretch pricing. It's hard to see a lot of uh, enticing things there. And so when we look across the board, we find more interesting opportunities in international markets because to, credit, to Priya's point that she was just making on the replay, I think stocks are at the high, yeah. IG and high yield are at tights. Like we, we think, think, there's, think there are interesting opportunities outside the US. We'll talk about those opportunities in a moment. You mentioned Priya, Priya's colleague, Bob Michael, I think was sort of like the statement of the year. A jaws dropped. He turned around and said, there's not enough bonds. It's not enough bonds after what we saw last October where we were talking about whether there were too many. Are you finding the same thing? All that supply that's come through already in 2024, all that demand that's met it, are we lacking bonds, really? I mean, it's, it's one, in, uh, one in one here because, again, we look at rates out the curve, long-end treasuries. You had record 10-year issuance. You have 30s today, $25 billion that are getting priced. And you had record supply in January, and it seems gobbled up time and again. Um, and I think that there's this fear in the market of missing the Fed going, and um, certainly from the real money community, that chasing for assets. Um, but are, I, there feels like there's a lot of bonds in the market, you know? <laughs> Justin Slacky here with us uh, from Shakeman Capital, who focuses on distress. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of distress, but you're still finding things to do in the U.S. Do you agree with Christina that there is sort of this push outside to look for uh, some opportunities? Or are you finding stuff here? I think there's a lot of opportunities in the U.S. If you look at the high yield market, the average dollar price of the high yield market is 92 cents on the dollar. Uh, you can only have bought high yield below par in really crisis periods of time, except for today. Uh, and if you think about that, we have shorter durations than we ever have had in high yield. You're at about three duration. And we're at the precipice of a large M&A cycle. Uh, and the government has basically said we're not going to allow large cap M&A. So if that doesn't happen, that means large caps are going to buy mid-sized companies. All of those mid-sized companies live in leverage finance. And so if you can buy companies at a discount to par before an M&A cycle, that gives you a lot of capital appreciation opportunity in addition to the fact that current yields and yields are more like 7 or 8% right now. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in that market. We'll get into exactly how you identify potential takeout candidates. But Christina, do you agree? I mean, is that something that you're looking at as well? Look, I think coming out of the COVID period, you have... A, a different historical context when you look at the default risks in all of these companies. And I'm not the credit expert, but again, when we look at high yield and IG just on the surface, I think we are at tight historical levels. Um, that said, we have a Fed that we've had some walk back of if March is on the table or not. But I think the, the base case is still their next steps are easing and that is supportive for risk assets, right? So can rich assets stay rich? I think absolutely. You want to look international, mm -hmm. where? Um, I think 
the uh, emerging markets is probably what's most interesting. And I think LATAM is probably, again, what draws some of the most focus. And Why I was, is that? Why LATAM? We were having a conversation yesterday. And again, this shift from globalization to regionalization and Again, we certainly have elections in the second half of the year and the, in the um, volatility that'll bring, but places like Mexico and LATAM as a whole should benefit from that. And you look at the company hiring of all of these major companies, the ENYs of the world and the Amazons and all these major home, home company names that are hiring there and the ability for companies to reach into those markets. Is this a shift from China? Are we moving to Vietnam, to Mexico, to get around this China-U.S. breakdown in the relationship? Um, I think that that will probably be a follow-on impact. And I think either way, look, I think China is in some sense dealing with its own issues and have a different growth prospect than where we are in a lot of other emerging markets. How much is all of this predicated on the rate-cutting cycle coming through? I think a lot of it is. Um, certainly. But I think that those are the next steps for the Fed. And I think the Fed is still the driver of international markets and global markets, really. And I think the message from Powell, again, when we're like deep in the nitty gritty of the rates market, there's a lot of concern in this turmoil of March is off. Is it May? Is it June? But I think the message is the same, that we're still moving in the right direction. And I think Powell's point that he made that it's no longer about we need to manufacture weakness in, in the economy. We need to manufacture a labor market problem. We just need more confidence in inflation. So I think it's a timing issue. Justin, how much when you're looking at some of these idiosyncratic uh, transactions, are you factoring in rates? How much is that part of the equation? Yeah, I think the Fed has made rates an impossible thing to ignore over the last decade, right? Because it's really been the driver of whether it's a risk on or risk off market. When we look at rates and where the Fed is today, we just think that we're going to be here for a while. The Fed has gotten us to where we need it to be. And now they're going to slowly decrease rates over some period of time, but we're going to be more elevated than we were in the past. Wherever that winds up being, it's still going to be higher than where we were. And as a result, companies are going to have to figure out how to operate in a higher rate environment. And that's true for emerging markets, and it's true for the U.S. And as companies try to figure that out, it's going to be harder. And that's why you're going to have some companies do well and some countries do well, and then a lot really struggle uh, because they haven't had to operate in an environment where there was a hurdle rate for any investment. And now there's going to be a hurdle rate going forward. Given your thesis is really prescribed to the Fed cutting, which everyone agrees on, does it actually matter to you, though, the timing of it? Um, I think the when you take a step back and look at 24 as a whole, no, the thematics remain the same, that we should have a weaker dollar and we should see spread compression in emerging markets um, and we should see steeper curves in the U.S. Does the timing matter of when exactly that happens? Yes. And I think, will there be some shorter term cross currents of does the ECB go first? Does the Fed go first? These back and forth. Um, but I think the thematic when we sit at the end of the year, that will be the story that the Fed has unleash this. And even the financial condition easing that we've seen since December with that messaging shift from them. I hear some of these conversations, Justin, it feels like the elephant in the room is the election that no one wants to talk about and everyone wants to ignore. I'm looking at Lisa. I know. would love to ignore <laughs> the election. Justin, can you really have a call for things like the Federal Reserve, for inflation, for growth, without a decent idea of who's in the White House and who controls Congress, given some of the policies we might see? I think that's why nobody's talking about it, because, you know, you can have your base case, yeah. which is based on what you see today. And we know that one of the two options is chaos. That's what we had for four years. Every day you had to read the news because you didn't know what regulation was going to change or where the country was headed in that day. If we go that route, Fed policy, all these things are going to get wrapped up. Uh, and, you know, it could change dramatically how us and all investors look at the marketplace. The financial regulation could shift. Deals that don't make sense today could all of a sudden make sense in 12 months time. Lisa, we were talking about that joint venture with Disney, Warner Brothers and Fox. Maybe the regulator is upset about that. I don't know. You'd imagine in 12 months time, if it's a Trump White House, the regulator won't be interested. Spirit and JetBlue will get done. I mean, here's the question, Possibly. especially with all the mergers and acquisitions. How much does that kind of shift really affect where you might look or, or where you might not? Justin,
this was great. It's fantastic to catch up. Let's do this again. Justin Slacky there of Schenkman Capital and Christina Kampmanni of Invesco. To the two of you, thank you. Coming up in the next hour, the third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance. Do not miss this. Around a table with us, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, Bob Doll of Crossmark Global Investments, Lee Clasco of Bloomberg Intelligence, a Richmond Fed President with a lot to talk about. Lisa, the definition of what is greater confidence and how many more CPI prints do we need? Yeah, and what is likely? How does, what, do we keep it's assign be, that a 21% chance? It's going to be fun, yeah. isn't it? Sort of March, yes or no. And exactly. Take it from there. Yeah. Mike McKee's going to supervise, don't worry. He'll be with us <laughs> at about 8.30 Eastern time. From New York City, equity futures on the S&P down by 0.2%. Into the bond market, 30-year yields ahead of that auction, up three basis points. Your yield, 4.36. From New York, this is Bloomberg. What Chairman Powell told us was that a strong labor market, strong economy wouldn't preclude them from cutting rates. And I think that's still the case. As you see from the policy speak, there is no hurry for cuts anytime soon. That's why the Fed's pushed back. I think they have scar tissue from this inflation of the last couple of years. Chair Powell might be having a challenge corralling everybody on the committee. I think he wants to make that first move based on a strong consensus. The problem that we have in the market in this zombie-like economic environment where it's not discernible. You're chasing your tail. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz, together with Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market on the S&P 500, negative by 0.2%. Ever course, Julian Emanuel talking about FOMO colliding with fear. Lisa... What's new about that? That's the conversation of the last couple of hours. This equity market keeps on grinding higher. Which is the reason why people don't have a lot of conviction in it or a lot of love for it. I mean, basically, there's a question of what you get if you have volatility with potentially record gains. Does this lead to some sort of downdraft or just more volatility with higher <laughs> S&P 500 targets? Well, earnings so far are doing OK. So let's pick out a single name. Here's your single name. The Walt Disney Company in the pre-market up by close to 8%. 7.83% higher on Disney stock. Lisa, we spoke to the CFO about 30 minutes ago, constructive on the outlook for this company. Yeah, pretty much across the board, the hopes and dreams of the, uh, the brand uh, and the beauty of it. He was talking also, though, about this joint venture that they're going to have and this sort of uh, sports outlet, this point about how they're all going to bid separately, this point about how it's going to be priced. And yes, this is just a way to diversify and make it better for the consumer, but we're not trying to blow anyone out of the business or lower prices. But it raises a lot of questions going forward of exactly how this will pan out. Well, here's the question for regulators. Are regulators going to be unhappy, Anne-Marie, with the prospect of a joint venture between the likes of the Walt Disney Company, Warner Brothers Discovery and Fox as well? That's one question. The second question is, will it matter depending on who wins November's election? But if you look at the mood music coming out of the DOJ and the FTC, Lena Khan in Washington, D.C., I mean, where's JetBlue in spirit right now? That has serious hurdles. Are they going to like this kind of consolidation? I'm not sure. Got to work out how this is even going to work. So, Lisa, it's early days, and it feels like really early days. Hadn't spoken to the leaks. They were very clear about why. Wanted to keep this confidential, understand all of that. Still need to work out a price. Still not being told a name. Just know that it launches in full. And still don't really know how any of it's going to work from there on. Which is curious because it's going to launch pretty soon. So it raises a whole host of questions, uh, none of which were particularly answered. But we do have a sense uh, that the mood music is it uh, hasn't really angered too many people, at least according to Disney, which is, you know, sure. uh, you're hearing maybe from some certain sports leagues a little bit. There's of one really impressive element, though, of the Walt Disney numbers, just international theme parks. Yeah. We've been worried about consumer confidence in China. Don't hear that about the theme park in Shanghai. We've been worried about the backlash against America Inc. What you're seeing happen to Starbucks, what's happened to McDonald's, don't see that when it comes to the Walt Disney Company either. And he basically is saying ongoing strength there. Putting all of that aside, and we did hear from Hugh Johnston, you know, the sort of dream and, and the sort of brand of uh, Disney and the magic of that, the magic of buybacks and share of share of purchases and a dividend. Really, to me, this, this is, this is uh, a notable element of this, considering that this is a feature of a number of the outperformers. They give the cash back. And this, I wonder how much this is going to be a theme as equity, cash and interest starts to become more dominant. If I could bottle Bramo, that segment would be it right there. <laughs> uh -oh. Forget Mickey Mouse. It's about the magic of buybacks and cost cuts. 
And let's face it, Lisa, isn't this what the likes of Triumph, Nelson Peltz want to see? I mean, yes, exactly. So how much is this a direct response to Nelson Peltz? Take this for magic. On the other hand, you know, this is really what a lot of investors are looking for, ultimately. And that's what they've been rewarding. I mean, we think about Meta. Yeah, they did a blowout quarter, but also they uh, instated bigger buybacks and uh, dividends. So this, to me, is really going to be something I'm looking for. They don't want to talk about him, but they're talking directly to him. The stock <laughs> is up by something like 8% in the pre-market. The broader price action on the S&P 500 looks like this. We're negative by 0.14%. Yields are higher by a single basis point. The 10-year 4.1366. Coming up this hour, here's the lineup. Crossmark's Bob Dole urging caution as the S&P flirts with 5K. Lee Klasko of Bloomberg Intelligence on Maersk's warning for the shipping industry. And Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin calling for patience when it comes to rate cuts. We begin with our top story. 90 minutes out from the opening bell and the S&P 500 within striking distance of 5,000. Bob Dole, CIO a crossmark global investments out with a warning saying, quote, credit spreads are probably too tight relative to the risk of some economic weakness or slowdown. Fourth quarter earnings reports have exhibited modest margin pressure. Bob, I'm pleased to say, joined us now for more. Bob, great to catch up, mate. As always, start of the year. We talked about this in the last hour. Price for perfection. Then we keep on rallying. Bob, what's going to hold us back? Uh, hard to say. I'm uh, one of those fully invested but biting, biting my fingernails. Look, I don't know where the market's going near term, but I can make a few observations. Number one, every week that passes, the expectation about how much the Fed's going to cut rates gets less. Two, every week that passes, earnings estimates for the full year come down a little bit. Three, the stock market is selling at over 20 times earnings. I put those three things together, and I don't know. I, I can't make the case for a whole lot of upside other than momentum, which is very powerful. But Bob, you're giving me an easy four, haven't you? And you said it. Four, the stock market keeps rallying. Bob, let's talk about what we're standing on. Are we standing on the shoulders of fewer and fewer names in the stock market? And is that necessarily a problem? Well, we saw that uh, for most of last year. It broadened November, December. We came into the new year and you know the story. Um, the, the, you know, the uh, S&P 500 uh, is lagging the, the Magnificent Seven, although there's been some, some fraying there, but these mega cap stocks are, are still working. Uh, history would tell us that as markets get narrower, the risk goes up, but it lasted for a long time last year. I think the only way we get a significant broadening is more confidence about breadth in the economy and breadth in earnings, and that doesn't seem to be the case uh, today. Bob, I love your description of sitting there fully invested, biting your fingernails, saying, I don't like anything about this, but momentum is a powerful freight train and I can't get against it. What would make you change your tune? If you could convince me that earnings estimates are going to go up, uh, that the Fed's going to cut rates as much as... Look, you can't have it both ways, in my view. You can't have double-digit earnings growth, Lisa, which is what the consensus has, and have enough room for the Fed to cut rate rates five or six times. I, one of those is going to get disappointed, maybe both. Um, so you can, if you can tell me I'm wrong and we are going to get multiple cuts, inflation is heading to 2% and we're going to get double digit earnings gains. I have no choice but to buy more stocks. In the meantime, what's your defense? How do you play defense at a time where a lot of people say that there's an equal upside to inflation and growth as a risk as there is to the downside? So so the, the defense or, or portfolio positioning I want quality. I want earnings predictability, earnings persistence, good cash flow multiples. What I don't want is companies where the only way I win is if a PE ratio goes up. I'm not betting on that. So I want to have that ballast in terms of uh, uh, earnings and cash flow. Which brings us to Disney and the hopes and dreams of uh, share buybacks and dividends. How important is it for you to see some dividend uh, increase, some sort of share rebuy buyback uh, that is announced at some of these earnings. Is that sort of a defining feature of a winning stock of quality? Well, it, it, it is a possible feature there. I'm more interested more broadly, cash flow. Is it increasing? And yes, what are they doing with it? If they can get a higher return by reinvesting in their business rather than giving it back to me, I'd prefer them to do that. But where cash flow, increasing cash flow, reasonable multiple on cash flow. Secondarily, what are they doing with it? 
cost cuts. That's what I want to talk about, PayPal. PayPal in the pre-market is down about 9%, struggling for profit growth, forecasting little of that for 2024. And as we've heard in the last month or so, cutting about 9% of the workforce. Bob, you've talked about margins and some of the pressure coming through. Are we at that phase of the cycle now, where we start to see defence of that, where we start to see more layoffs coming from corporate America? I think so. We've already seen it to some degree in technology. Financials are uh, picking up in terms of the number of layoffs. And a lot of that, as you point out, is a reaction to, I got to support my profit margins. Maybe I can't raise my prices like I was before, which is typical of this this phase uh, and typical more normally. Uh, where big price increases are, are, are not normal. We've had some of that because of the, the demand for so many things. And that's just backing off some, which is another risk to the earnings picture. Are you more constructive on some sectors over the other, others and their ability to handle some of those issues? Uh, yeah, I think, and, and part of it is based on valuations, and I come back to uh, one more time, uh, the cash flow. I think if we get into some sloppiness, if the market fades a little bit, the financial and energy sectors, because of their cheapness, because of their multiple on cash flow, uh, may uh, offer some defensive characteristics. And then you got the staples, um, and the pr price increases there uh, continue to be pretty good. Hey, Bob. Good to hear from you. Bob Dole there okay. of Crossmark Global Investments. Good to catch up, as always, to kick off things this morning. City, right on cue. Bramo, when cutting 10% of the wealth employees over in London. So a bit of reporting from the team here at Bloomberg. City Wenger moved to cut 51 roles across its wealth business in London as the division's new chief looks for ways to boost the returns generated by the unit. Seeing more of this, and you can say, Lisa, that it's idiosyncratic. Jane Fraser's big turnaround story over at City, but these stories are piling up. And it's piling up at a time where maybe it's returned to the past, it's a normalization, or maybe this is uh, the start of a new cycle of cost cutting. I will just say it's about 50 staffers uh, there and about that this would affect in London. Real question, though, to me, and that's actually what I was thinking about this morning. Is this just normalization? I was looking at McKinsey, for example, and putting people on notice. Is this going back to the way it used to be before the pandemic and labor hoarding? Or is this something else? I just don't think we know yet. The stock is down by, let's call it 0.4%. Very marginal move there in the pre-market for City. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Consulting firm McKinsey is putting 3,000 staffers on review as the economy slows. Employees will have about three months to show better performance or be asked to leave the company. More workers are facing the notice this year after McKinsey grew headcount by 60% since 2018. Similar firms announced job cuts at the end of last year, while consulting pulls back from a pandemic boom. Apple's limited release of its Vision Pro headset is prompting a hefty resale market overseas. The $3,500 device is only available in certain U.S. stores, and overseas resellers are charging a chunky premium. Some are going for more than $5,000. Apple has limited the rollout of the new headset in order to accommodate the elaborate setup and customization process for each buyer. Demand for rental properties in Manhattan has surged by 14% in January, keeping rents higher during the traditionally quiet, quieter winter period. The median price for new leases was up to 1.3% from January 2023 at $4,150. That's still lower than July's record-setting median price of $4,440 a month. New Yorkers have been seizing on the slight decline in costs from the summer peak. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Danny, thank you. Just want to go over that again, not for personal reasons, not because my lease is up at the end of this month, but <laughs> rent was only up 1.3%. Just 1.3%. Yeah. You know, just as Have that negotiation begins. Yeah. Just want to repeat that. Rents were only up. <laughs> hold up. Hold up. No, 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 no. You're going to go here. Have you fully reset from the pandemic levels? Still working that out, yeah. Okay. All right. Rents yeah. have been climbing. Yeah, they've been yeah. going up loads. Yeah, yeah. Have they've you been, up lots. Have, you're they've locked been going in. up lots. You're locked in on a COVID Hold on a era. minute. Rents are up 1.3% from January 23. That's really important to know. Up next on this program, <laughs> Mask is out That's with a warning. Yes. What is really unclear today is the situation is unfolding. It's still actually in, a, in an escalation phase. So we have rejigged our network completely, sailing everything south of the Cape of Good Hope. That's coming up next, live from New York. This is Bloomberg.
we are one hour and about 15 minutes away from the cash open, the open about just around the corner this morning. Good morning to you all. Equities on the S&P 500, negative by 0.16%. We are up by a basis point on a 10-year, 413.27. And crude is positive by about 1.4%, $74, and let's call it 90 cents. Under surveillance this morning, Maersk out with a warning. What is really unclear today is the situation is unfolding. It's still actually in, a, in an escalation phase. So we have rejigged our network completely, sailing everything south of the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and, and expect to do that for a while until we have really safe uh, passage uh, reopened in, uh, in the Red Sea. So this could be with us for a while. Here's the latest. Mass stock down, down hard by almost 17% in Europe. The shipping giant reporting fourth quarter earnings and guidance that fell short of expectations. Mass is warning of a glut in the industry when the conflict in the Red Sea normalizes and inflated rate freight rates return to normal. Lee Clasco, senior logistics analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us now for more. Lee, let's talk about that. The inflated freight rates. Lee, you've been on top of this. You've talked about this for a while, that this just won't last and ultimately these freight rates are going to come back down again. Lee, what's the outlook now? Yeah, I mean, uh, the comments from Maersk uh, really wasn't surprising to us. I mean, rates are up uh, between 200 and 300 percent since the October lows uh, when you're looking at, uh, you know, going between Asia and Europe. And the reality is, is the conflict in the Red Sea is has been a short term, unsustainable uh, kind of push on, on rates. And when things normalize and, and they will, I mean, uh, you know, our view is that it's going to be, you know, this is we're not going to be talking years. We're going to be talking months when this gets resolved. Uh, and once it gets resolved, not only are ships going to continue, um, you know, stop going around uh, the Cape of Good Hope, they're going to start going to the Suez Canal, and that's going to actually create a lot of capacity on the market. And what the shipping industry is facing is at least two years of supply outpacing demand, assuming normal growth trends in demand. Um, and, and that's, you know, well telegraphed. Uh, we, we kind of have a pretty good view of sight of where uh, supply is going because it takes a long time to order a, a order and then build a ship. Uh, and so we have that data available to us. Uh, so, you know, when you're looking at that, uh, plus call it low single digit demand growth, supply is going to be outgrowing demand by you know, 200 to 600 basis points over the next two years. Uh, and that's going to keep rates, um, you know, back to maybe not the October lows, but, you know, to uh, to lows well below where we are today. Lee, I want to get into supply for a moment. This didn't surprise you. It surprised someone. The stock is down by 17 percent. Lee, I know you don't do price targets, but can you explain that move? Well, well, the reality is since December, the stock's up 22 percent before today's move. So, uh, you know, I think the, the, the move in the stock near term was a, it was a knee jerk reaction from these, you know, creamy high rates. Uh, you know, there's no doubt that these rates are fantastic. And, uh, you know, expectations for Maersk and most liners were that they're going to lose money. And so most people were expecting, well, maybe they're not going to lose as much money or maybe they'll even make money this year. Uh, but the reality is that's still probably going to be hard to do. Again, assuming that our thesis is right, is that this doesn't uh, follow us through the whole year. Um, you know, the, the, the crisis in the, in the Red Sea. So, um, you know, the, probably it's going to be pretty hard uh, to make money in this market when rates, quote unquote, normalize. I'm really struck by the fact that what's bearish for Maersk is actually really bullish for humanity if the idea is that they're not going to necessarily get some sort of prolonged uh, fighting or conflicts. Do we have a sense of Maersk having any kind of inside view of this or just, uh, you know, how unexpected the idea of some sort of resolution is? Right. So obviously, uh, peace in the Middle East is pretty difficult to uh, to, to, to to get. Uh, but assuming that Israel and Hamas kind of end their hostilities, uh, you would think that the Houthis would stop the attacks. Um, the Houthis. Uh, the longer they do this, they're going to make more enemies around the globe. And some of their neighbors, like Egypt, Egypt's suffering a lot because of the Suez Canal uh, not being open. They're losing a lot of revenue that they rely on. Uh, and, you know, it's impacting global trade. It's impacting China. Uh, so, so, you know, 
while a lot of other countries are sitting at the sideline right now, and, and a lot of the inter, in, in, interaction has been uh, between the U.S., U.K., and, and the Houthis, you know, that coalition could grow the longer this, 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 this goes on. So, you know, but what I also would say is that I am an analyst, and I'm usually like a half glass uh, full kind of guy. You know, the good news is that, you know, Maersk was predicting low single digit volume growth. So that, that's, that's a good, good news for the global economy. Lee, the CEO said we have not seen the level of threat peak, which makes me think, are they going to start pulling back even more ships from going through the Red Sea? Well, well, the liner industry has really no more ships to pull back. The only ships that are going through the Suez Canal really are uh, tankers and dry bulk ships. Uh, a lot of the tanker ships are carrying Russian oil or Iranian oil. So I think they might get a free pass. Uh, but, you know, other other ships that might be covering, uh, carrying uh, goods that are heading to Israel or maybe U.S. or U.K. goods, um, you'll see those ships probably divert around the Suez Canal because it's getting, it's not only it's becoming dangerous, but it's becoming more expensive for shippers. Uh, insurance rates have gone up considerably, uh, you know, since, since, since the, uh, the activity that's been going on in the Red Sea. So it's becoming, you know, not only you're putting your, your, your ship and your crew at risk, you're also, you know, going to have to spend a lot more money uh, to go through the Suez. So, uh, if the conflict does uh, accelerate and the Houthis kind of expands who they're targeting or what kind of ships they're targeting, um, that would have a, a ripple effect uh, on the dry bulk and, and tanker markets, which have benefited from a rate perspective from uh, the dislocation created uh, by the issues in the Red Sea. Stepping back from the issues in the Red Sea, what did we learn from Mer Maersk in terms of shipping with China? Uh, you, you know, the reality is, is that China has not, you know, kind of come out of uh, or has recovered as quickly as a lot of uh, folks have thought, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, we're heading into the, the Lunar New Year, so there should be, a, a, you know, a seasonal slowdown. Um, you know, we're just still waiting for China to rev up their engines to, 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 to drive that, uh, not only the export demand, but the import demand of, of, of goods like iron ore and, and, and crude oil. So, uh, you know, China just is the engine f really for uh, global shipping. Uh, as China goes, so does demand for, you know, what again, whether it's the container liner industry, the tanker industry, or the dry bulk industry. So um, you know, we're still waiting for them to kind of emerge from, from their slumber, if you will. Lee, let's talk about where we started this conversation, which was excess capacity, too much right. supply. Lee, you cover an amazing industry, and I think we all remember coming out of the financial crisis 08, 09. This was a business and industry plagued by excess capacity, ships that had been given the green light to build all hit at exactly the wrong time. Lee, why is it so difficult in this industry to manage capacity? Why are we repeating that again? Well, there's, there's a few reasons. One, you know, by the time you order a ship and get it delivered, it can be well over a year. Uh, so, you know, when things are really good, they can turn pretty quickly, depending on the global economy. When the financial crisis happens, it's a, you know, a snap uh, in terms of, you know, a decline in demand. Uh, but then you also have, you know, not a lot of rational players. You have players that are just looking to be the biggest uh, or players that might be somewhat subsidized by their... Um, you know, the, the governments where they, where, where they reside to kind of ensure, of, you know, ensure free trade. So they want to make sure um, that their shipping industry is robust because either they need to import a lot of stuff or export a lot of stuff. So you have a, a lot of players that might not be in it for a profit. They just might be in it for, for other reasons, and they're willing to subsidize uh, those markets. So there's, there's a lot of reasons, um, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's gotten a little more consolidated over the years, but it's still, uh, you know, we would view as a, as a pretty fragmented market because there's a lot of small players out there. Amazing. Lee, good to hear from you. Let's catch up soon. Lee Klasko there of Bloomberg Intelligence, one of the big movers over in Europe today. That stock down by something like 16 or 17 percent. Bramo, not a surprise to him, but a surprise to many, clearly, given the stock move this morning. What I think is fascinating is so many of the headlines are saying that shipping bosses are coming out and they're warning about a prolonged conflict in the Red Sea. And you dig under the hood and the problem with the share price is that it's not going to go on for that much longer and they're not yeah. going to have the elevated pricing that they, uh, they had previously. Freight rates won't last because... Capacity is going to kick in and demand's not great. That's I mean, ultimately the story here, isn't it? Again, what's bearish for their stock is kind of bullish for humanity. So let's hope that okay. that's, you know. No, I mean, seriously, like, you just have to wonder. It's okay, a point well made. I'm with you. 
I just, you know, it's hard to be like, oh, it's terrible that we're going to have a resolution to a conflict that's, you know, been an issue. I'm just saying, I think it's interesting to see whether that is really going to be the case, especially given uh, the potential, you know, increase in demand. I was taken back by the line the CEO said, saying there's no clear line of sight and when and how the international community will be able to mobilize itself and guarantee safe passage for us. Is he putting out this flag to Washington, to London, to say, you're not doing enough when it comes to these Houthi militants that have directly attacked us. They haven't been able to restore order as much as they've tried. And the president himself has talked about it. It hasn't worked, but we'll keep on doing the same thing to try and make sure that it will work. Coming up in just a moment, jobless claims just around a corner. We'll get to that data in just a moment and reaction from a Fed official, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin. He joins us for the next 30 minutes. Mike McKee with us around the table as well. All of that still to come from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, waiting for jobless claims data. Going into it, here are the scores on the S&P 500, down by 0.2% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, also lower, negative by 0.2% as well. Going into that data, the bond market set up as follows. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Here are the scores for you. Yields a little bit higher on a 10-year by a single basis point. On a 30-year, up by two basis points. The yield on a 10-year, 4.13. On a 30-year, 4.34.52. With your jobless claims data, let's bring in Mike McKee. Hey, Mike. Hey, John. Well, it is another good day in the jobless world. 218,000 uh, jobless claims reported last month. Remember, we had the big job uh, last week. We had the big jump the week before up to 224, and now we've uh, gone backwards a little bit on that. I'm waiting to see the uh, latest uh, revisions to see uh, what last week it was 227. So last week was revised up, and this week we come way down to 218. On a continuing basis, 1,871,000. That is down from 1,894,000. So it does look like workers are still on the job. Companies are still holding on to their employees. Yields a little bit higher off the back of this, Mike. So we're up three or four basis points on a 10-year to 414. On a 30-year, up three basis points, at least at a 435. You put this together with jobless claims and together with payrolls, together with ISM services, manufacturing improving. It's pretty decent data over the last couple of weeks. If you're looking for cracks, you're not finding it. When people say, well, just fast forward, look at the real-time data. Well, here we have the real-time data, and it's confirming the strength that we saw last Friday. The 10-year yield, I'm noting, really taking a leg higher, 4.015% rounded up. To me, that's what I'm watching. Longer term, what does that suggest about the neutral rate and about long-term momentum underneath some of the recovery we've seen? Don't ask me because we can have that conversation right now. Real-time reaction with the Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin alongside Bloomberg's Mike McKee. President Barkin, good morning to you, sir. Thanks for having me here. And I'm, I am happy again. the data didn't surprise. Well, let's talk about this data. Let's talk about how much weight you're putting on it. It's really strong coming out of the gate for 2024. How much weight are you putting on this stuff at the moment? Well, I think the data has been uh, remarkable, and it's been remarkable uh, across the board. Yeah, the, the fourth quarter GDP, 3.3%, uh, the jobs numbers uh, last month. And I think all of them do talk about an economy that's fundamentally healthy. That's a great uh, thing. I, I am always cautious about numbers around the turn of the year. I mean, they're big seasonal adjustments. A great example would be uh, the, the jobs numbers last month. Um, the actual jobs were actually down 2.5 million because a lot of the retail uh, folks who were hired for Christmas, you know, then got laid off after. But the seasonal adjustments bring it up to a positive 353. So that's a pretty big seasonal adjustment. I, I, I look hard at it. I'm glad to see it coming in. That's the best data we have. But I'm not sure I'm going to take too much out of any one month. Markets are obviously interested in if and when the Fed is going to cut emphasis on the when. Uh, and I know you've said we don't have to be in any rush. But with the data like this, basically, uh, are you telling people, uh, you know, we're doing fine with rates where they are? Well, I have said you don't have to be in any particular hurry. You've got a dual mandate with employment and uh, inflation. And the employment side of the mandate, I mean, it's actually operating at historic levels, 3.7% unemployment, job gains we talked about, initial claims, uh, job openings. It's a very strong labor market still. And so... Um, gratified to see inflation coming down, hoping it continues to come down, and I think we've got some time to be patient. I know you said you don't have a roadmap for rate cuts. Yesterday, uh, Carlisle Group Chief Executive Harvey Schwartz said investors should not be thinking the Fed would cut rates five times this year because that would imply something's wrong with the economy. I assume you would agree with him. 
Well, it's hard for me to get into the market forecast because there's always two elements going on in those forecasts. One is uh, rate normalization under a healthy economy and inflation coming down. But the other, of course, is uh, the economy takes a wrong turn and you'd, you'd come down faster. And so those things are a weighted average. To me, there is certainly a model that you take rates down quickly. That's not a model that's good for the economy. That's just you know, one of the things that could happen. And then there's the model where you, know, you toggle rates down as you know, the economy comes back into balance. Underpinning this is really the mystery of the neutral rate. It's sort of this vague, mysterious concept that people throw around. Matt Lazzetti over at Deutsche Bank changed his view recently, saying that he thinks the neutral rate, instead of being about 3% in the post-pandemic reality, might be around 3.5% or even 4%. Does that jibe with your thinking? Uh, it's certainly conceivable to me that it's uh, come up from the estimates that we saw uh, before COVID. Um, the challenge with all these neutral rate estimates is the standard deviations, 200 basis points. And so uh, the center of the SEP, I think, in the last meeting was about two and a half. So it could be a half, it could be four and a half. And so I think you have to sort of uh, make your decisions not based on trying to hit a theoretical neutral, but based on what you see in the economy and what you learn about how the economy reacts to rates. And I, that's what I'm trying to do. I guess as I'm watching some of the data come in and I hear from all of these investors, they're concerned about reaccelerating inflation later in the year as some of these comps change. Are you also starting to worry about that a little bit more? Well, we've already had a lot to worry about in today's conversation, so I, I won't focus on all of the worries I have. We've got I, more. I saw, we I saw the shipping out. conversation yeah. earlier today. Lisa specialized in worry time. Yeah, no, there's, <laughs> a, there's, a, there, there's a lot to worry about. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think you have to acknowledge how good the inflation data has been for the last seven months. I mean, last seven months, core inflation, 1.9%. That's right on target. That's terrific, right? And I'm not rooting against inflation, but I'm always, you know, trust but verify, you know, let's make sure that's really right. And so we'll get a few more months. It would be, uh, I would very much like to see that trend continue and, you know, broaden because it's been disproportionately goods deflation that's been masking higher than normal prices and rents and shelter. So I'd love to see it broaden. Um, and maybe it will. I, I, you know, the trend is good and you can't argue with that that trend. Let's just see how we go. How do you parse inflation these days, though? Because, uh, yes, the PCE is down below 3%, but when you look at uh, things like the Cleveland and Dallas trimmed means, the Atlanta Fed uh, sticky wage index, uh, it all shows basically more inflation than your targeted index. Well, these numbers will uh, converge over time, right? And so What's happening right now in inflation, as I said, is you've got a lot of clawback of goods price increases that happened during COVID. And so goods deflation, which has always been a factor, is even more significant than it has been you know, over the last 20 years. Uh, rents and services are higher. These trim mean measures look at the center of the distribution. And so they're looking at that center part, which is higher, as opposed to the weighted average, uh, which is lower. If it broadens, everything will come down. If it doesn't, it won't. And we'll just see what happens. Well, how do you make a judgment then on when you think it'll be appropriate to cut? What are you looking for? Um, the phrase I think the chairman and others have used is measurable progress toward the 2% target. How, how would you define that? Uh, if I could get these kind of numbers sustained and even better broadened, that's, that's what I'm looking for, sustained and broadening. There was a worry in the news conference, and you could sense that with Chairman Powell, that he wasn't comfortable yet. And I wonder if you're not comfortable either, just with this idea that maybe the improvement we've seen over the last six months is down to so-called one-off factors. Do you share that concern as well? Well, uh, another way to put it is that um, core inflation, I mean, headline inflation for last year uh, was whatever, 2.6%. Um, there was a 3.3% six-month period and a 1.9% six-month period. So which do you believe, the 3.3 or the 1.9? So we're rounding now over those 3.3 months. January last year was a very inflationary Month. So everything is leaning in terms of the numbers should be coming down, and I expect them to come down over the next few months. But let's see if they do. It speaks to this risk that maybe we stabilize above target on inflation. And Mike, as you know, the worry is that we do stabilize above target, and if you've started to cut interest rates, you have to start hiking again. Is that a concern that you have, that if you do start to move, you're stuck mm -hmm. in that cycle then, and you have to continue, and you can't start hiking again? Well, you're always trying to be cautious because you don't really want to reverse course, uh, uh, an interesting period to look at is 86. In 1986, after at the end of the Volcker era, um, inflation was actually under 2%. And the Fed, which had tightened significantly, started loosening significantly. In 87, inflation basically doubled from where it was in 86, and the Fed started increasing again. So that stuff has happened in history, and you're certainly aware of that. And to the extent you could avoid it, you'd love to avoid Does it. Does that weigh on you? 
as an official, just the experience of, of Volcker and Co? Well, a lot of people write about the history of Fed tightening cycles don't, don't end well. And so, um, you know, it'd be awesome for it to end well. But as you go study the past, it's not like you study the past and you see lots of great examples um, that you're just dying to duplicate. Let me take the uh, other side of the argument, and that is that inflation is going to keep coming down, but you're not going to move fast enough, and the economy is going to slow more than it needed to or even go into recession because the Fed waited too long. That's the risk you're trying to balance. And, and like I said, I, I take a lot of signal about just how historically strong the labor market continues to be, including the claims numbers uh, we saw this morning. And so you are trying to balance the risk to the employment side of the mandate versus the risk to the inflation side of the mandate. Inflation still elevated. The unemployment side still very strong. I think that's how I net out right now. We were in Jackson Hole a number of months ago. We were talking to some of your colleagues about some of the anecdotes they were hearing in their district. Remember that conversation, Lisa? Yeah. And the guidance that we were getting from some Fed officials is that what they were hearing in their district was different to what they were seeing in the data. Mm -hmm. Do the anecdotes conflict with the economic data? Um, well, I'll give you some anecdotes. I, mean, I was in Western Carolina earlier this week, just some things that might be uh, interesting. Um, uh, one is that I saw Great Clips had a sale on haircuts for $9.99. And so that's interesting that even some services are coming down in price. That would be consistent with the data. Uh, there's a big paper mill uh, that laid off 1,100 people in a county of 17,000. And a year later, unemployment in that county is down not up because there were so many openings for people in manufacturing positions that all of the people who were surplus who didn't retire you know had jobs so that's confirmatory of a strong uh, labor market i think the third quarter five percent gdp stuff that wasn't what i was hearing either and i said the same thing but today what i'm hearing is um, people aren't hiring as much but they're not firing as much either um, price setters understand they're on the back end of the price curve it's not over yet but they're on the back end uh, of it and demand is especially on the consumer side is still healthy do you trust the data and i say this because some of the headline data people have been saying people aren't responding to the surveys to the same degree yeah. post pandemic as they were pre-pandemic does that factor in uh, well you have to always take data with a grain of salt you also have to accept it's all you've got right and you have to be wary of uh, confirmation bias you know i like the data when it agrees with what i think and i don't like the data when it doesn't so when the data comes in i take it for what it is and i try to dig into it and understand you know does it uh, uh what's behind the numbers like the seasonal adjustments i was talking earlier but but i accept it and then try to test it as opposed to rejecting anything that doesn't agree with my prior hypothesis i think that uh, great clips offer was for mullets for the Super Bowl. So did you see anybody walking you're, around with you're, mullets? You're nice to say it wasn't just because of my hairline that I got a cheap <laughs> offer. Uh, no, uh, the, uh, the hiring that we have seen in recent months, is that do you expect that? Well, first of all, was it a surprise to see the December, January numbers? And uh, do you expect that to continue or are we going to fall off dramatically? And uh, will we see unemployment start to go up to the 4.1% the SCP calls for? Uh, I was surprised at how strong the numbers were in, uh, in December and in, in January, December revised and in January. Um, what I'm hearing is not as much hiring, but definitely not as much firing. That's, that's how I put it together. Labor hoarding? Uh, I, that's, the, that's sort of the technical phrase, but I, especially with frontline people, if you have really fought hard over the COVID era to bring people into your factory or into your restaurant, you're just loath to take the risk of letting them go and try to go into that fight again. And so on the frontline side, people are being careful. To the extent that I'm hearing anything on job cuts, it's actually the professional side. It's, uh, it's overhead. And your business, maybe your pricing power isn't going to be what you thought it was going to be. You're worried about the risk on the, um, on the operation side to laying off operating people. Well, let's take a look at our overhead and thin it. That's where you see it. And some of the jobs announcements you've seen recently, I think, disproportionately look like overhead as opposed to frontline. Interesting. Seeing a lot of that this morning as well. We've talked about those companies too. There was a moment in the news conference last week where Chairman Powell was asked about the month of March, and it felt like that kind of off the cuff, he just got freezing cold water and poured it all over March. We're trying to work out whether that was Chairman Powell's view or if that's the general view of the committee that you share as well, that perhaps March is just too soon. Well, I don't ever prejudge a meeting, and I don't, prejudge the March meeting. We'll see where we uh, get. But I always think Chairman Powell speaks for the committee. He was talking about the balance sheet too. And that sounded much more interesting. If they're not going to cut interest rates, maybe they make a decision about QT collectively, the committee, you. Can we talk about that? The decision that you've got to make, is it independent of the interest rate decision for you? What happens with the balance sheet from here? Can you do one and continue with the other? Uh, independent of the um, 
uh, the rent interest rate decision because you're talking about normalizing um, and when is the right time to start uh, normalizing rates and you're talking about normalizing the balance sheet. So we're still in the process of doing that. Um, uh, as Chairman Powell said, we'll, we'll have a conversation uh, about it and I think it's great that we do that because you want to plan uh, what you do. I still haven't seen any signals that you know, we're closing in on a level of ample, you know, uh, mar you know, at the end of the ample reserves uh, regime. Uh, just a number that keeps hitting me. If you add up the overnight RRP plus the reserves today, we're still over four trillion. And if you look at September 2019, we were in the 1.2, 1.3 trillion in reserves without an overnight RRP and without a standing repo facility. So I, I think we're a pretty long way from where we were then. And you know, times change. We'll see where we are. We've got to learn more. But I still think we're a long way from where we were. You then. know where I'm going because you do hear people say that if you start cutting interest rates, but you're still doing QT, they're sort of running in opposition to each other. Do you not see it that way? Don't. We'll leave it there. Tom, you're going to stick with us. Tom Barkin. Thank Blunt you. and to the point. We appreciate it. The Richmond Fed president is going to stick with us. Let's get you up to speed on some top stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. City is weighing a move to cut 10% of its wealth employees in London. That's about 51 positions. According to a memo seen by Bloomberg, City's wealth business is, quote, continuing to identify areas to improve efficiency through structural changes and cost-based reductions. City is in the middle of a vast restructuring that will see the bank cut 5,000 jobs for the end of this quarter. Share, shares of Ralph Lauren are rising after its third quarter earnings beat estimates. The company saw total comparable sales up 9%. That's almost double what analysts had expected. Ralph Lauren CEO says the results, quote, exceeded our expectations, led by continued momentum in direct-to-consumer channels. The U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments today in a case which could decide whether Donald Trump can be excluded from ballots. Lawyers are expected to argue that his involvement in the 2021 Capitol Hill insurrection violates the 14th Amendment. Trump's defense will argue this provision doesn't apply to a former president. If Trump were to lose the case, he could effectively be barred from holding the presidency again. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Hey, Danny, thank you for that. Up next on the program, banking crisis concerns creeping back in. I do have a concern about commercial real estate. I believe it's manageable, although there may be some institutions that are quite stressed by this problem. That conversation continues just around the corner. In the equity market right now on the S&P 500, equity futures negative by 0.1%, yields higher by, let's call it four basis points on a 10-year, 414. Jobless claims come in lower than expected, 218 against an estimate of 220 from a beautiful New York. This is Bloomberg. Forty-two minutes away from the opening bound in New York. Equities doing okay. We're negative 0.1% on the S&P. Yields a little bit higher following better than expected jobless claims. The right kind of downside surprise, as we like to say. Yields are higher by two or three basis points on the 10-year, 4.14.63. Under surveillance this morning, banking stress concerns creeping back in. I do have a concern about commercial real estate. Commercial real estate is an area that um, we've long been aware um, could create financial stability risks or um, losses in the banking system. And um, this is something that requires careful supervisory attention. Here's the latest this morning. Investors looking for signs of financial stress after fears in commercial real estate sent shares of New York Community Bank plunging to a multi-decade low. The pain also found in Europe and Asia as banks across the globe prepare themselves for potential losses in CRE. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin with us around the table this morning together with Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Tom, it's fantastic to continue this conversation. The worries of the banking sector of last year, different this year. Last year was about working through interest rate shocks. Now it's about potentially credit stress. Is this coming up on the committee? When you saw that in NYCB last week, the day of the decision, is this something you all talked about together collectively? Well, uh, commercial real estate, as the secretary said, is a, a known issue, uh, and it's an important issue. I was in D.C. yesterday uh, doing a, a roundtable with some real estate executives. That's a market that struggled to come back, and, and you can feel the stress uh, in the commercial real estate area, particularly, of course, uh, downtown office. So that, that's a real thing, and the banks, uh, many banks and non-banks have exposure to that. That's an important thing to take into account in terms of stability. 
But as I say, it's not a new kind of risk. I mean, we have had real estate shocks before. We've gone through real estate cycles. It wouldn't stun me if you know, a bank or two ended up wrong-footed in those things. But the system knows that real estate is an you know, asset with a certain amount of risk. And I'm hope, I hope and expect that you know, we've got enough capital to uh, weather that. A lot of people have speculated that the Fed would cut rates in response to another bank failure. Do you think that that's an accurate assessment or do you think that that is not the correct channel of response? Because that's basically what's based into the market, a lot of people are saying. Mandates employment and inflation. You've got to take into account what you think is going to happen to employment and inflation. If the economy is to turn south, I mean, that's a, a case for trying to normalize rates faster. But the economy would have to turn south as opposed to this being some sort of a bank oversight uh, response. The chairman said that uh, this is a manageable problem, uh, commercial real estate. But uh, I want to ask if you think that in the context of Fed officials, including the then chairman, telling us in 2007 that real estate was not going to collapse. Sorry, and your question is? <laughs> uh, do you have a good handle on this? Uh, can you be sure that this is something that's manageable? Well, in the banks that we supervise, I mean, we're spending a lot of time uh, with them and productively going through real estate assets and trying to understand what the risks are and what the reserves are against those risks and, and making sure we've got those things appropriately handled. So in the scope that we've got, um, we're working hard on that. I, I think you never know what you don't know. And so uh, you know, what might happen in the non-bank sector don't know, you know, what could happen, you know, with these real estate assets, we'll see. But I think we've got our head down with the banks that we oversee trying to work through it. Well, does this weigh on your thinking at all about when you might want to cut interest rates? The story that the real estate people tell is that this problem is only going to get worse over time as companies get closer to their refinancing. I think it's important to take commercial real estate apart. I mean, there are huge parts of commercial real estate that are quite healthy. Data centers would be a good example. Retail is healthy. Um, at least the holding part of multifamily, you know, the building has its issues. We're really talking about office and a narrower, you know, B and C downtown office space. That's where the biggest risk is. And I'm sure there will be losses and already have been and will be losses in that space. Um, but as I said, it's a known variable. If you go back to our stress test assumptions, you'll see pretty significant, uh, you know, stress on commercial real estate valuations. And you saw the outcomes for the bank. So there are a lot of known variables out there, which is the reason why we're so worried. And you said there's a lot of worry around this table. We were worrying earlier with a bunch of credit people who are no longer worried because somehow some of these maturities are not an issue. How do you understand the fact that people were talking about zombie companies, they were talking about zombie real estate, they were talking about how the world was going to be turned on its head when the Fed raised rates by five, five and a half percentage points. How do you make sense of the fact that that just hasn't happened? Um. Is it possible that some of them were wrong? I'm just not sure. I, 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 but if, if it's not that, if it's not. So, so uh, here are the numbers that have really spoken to me, which is um, if you look at the total interest burden of, uh, for individuals and the total interest burden for companies, and you divide that total interest burden today by uh, total revenue for companies or total personal disposable income for individuals, the numbers have finally now, in the aggregate, just gotten back to 2019 levels. And so what does that mean? There are a lot of people, individuals, who uh, refinance their mortgages or pay down their credit cards. There are a lot of companies that refinance their debt when rates were very low. And so there are absolutely companies that are wrong-sided, wrong-footed in this. But in aggregate, this total interest burden hasn't yet hit the, company, the country in that scope, I think, that a lot of people have predicted. It could. I mean, that's a good reason to be cautious on the economy. On the other hand, the continued month over month health of demand, you know, look at GDP for the last half of last year, sort of argues against it. But that's, that's what you watch. We've got about two minutes left, which means we should probably talk about something you definitely don't want to talk about, which is politics yeah. down in Washington. When senators and officials in Washington start to write letters to the chairman to ease policy, how does the committee respond to that? It's a big election year. You talk about live meetings. We're wondering how live some of the meetings are going into that election. How do you avoid getting into politics. Listen, I think the chairman was brilliant on 60 Minutes. And if you watched it, he sort of closed with a very clear answer to that, which is we just try to do the right thing. And I think his phrase was integrity is priceless. And I thought that was very well put. The chairman on 60 Minutes also yeah. talked about the urgency of the fiscal health of the country, CBO yesterday. Debt will hit a record high. So much of that is for net interest payments. Is that a reason to potentially cut rates? Um, I, I assume you'll have other people on and ask the question of whether it's to cut Debt. I mean, yeah, there's, a, there's two ways you go. I think we're trying to focus on inflation and on unemployment. And uh, I think uh, having rates uh, be in restrictive levels 
is good for the long term. And if we can get inflation down to where we want to, and if employment can stay in the right place, rates can normalize, and that'll reduce that burden. But our objective function is not around the country's debt burden. Our objective function is around what Congress has asked us to do, which is inflation and unemployment. Tom, it's good to see you. Thanks for Thank catching you for up. Having me back. Appreciate your time, as always. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin there, alongside Bloomberg's Michael McKee. To round out the program this morning, just a brief look ahead to tomorrow. Jay Pulaski of TPW, Thomas Kennedy of JP Morgan, Dana Peterson of the Conference Board, and US Air Force veteran David Deptula, now of Academy Securities. Bramo, a lot to talk about with that crew. Yeah, especially if Maersk sees it resolving, uh, at least in the near term. Let's hear what he has to say uh, with respect to the Red Sea. 34 minutes away from the opening bow, equity futures negative here by 0.1% on the S&P 500. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.